this morning. Can you tell me a, a little bit about the 15 individuals and what we are going to see as a result of these new sanctions? So these new sanctions are aimed at military personnel, military generals, part of the uh, Russian Federation's army. Uh, and so bit by bit, like you're seeing every day, our goal is to increase our pressure on the uh, Russian regime. And again, we're sanctioning these individuals because they're part of the decision making uh, that is uh, linked to the catastrophe that we're seeing in Ukraine right now. So I, I know that the prime minister, when we were both in Europe, he announced uh, you know, sanctions against some other individuals. Why are you doing this kind of piecemeal and bits and pieces? Why not do it all at one time? You know, there were individuals that had connections to the FSB that Canada waited to sanction. Why, why not do it all at once? We're many partners doing it at the same time, and we coordinate. So within the G7, all the ministers, we share information, we share names, and our goal at the end of the day is that Europe, North America, is aligned in making sure that these sanctions are imposed. You know, there have been talks about whether or not there is going to be a meeting of NATO leaders soon, possibly even next week. Do you have any information on that and whether or not we could see something like that coming? on that, but definitely it is important that NATO leaders meet, it is important that G7 leaders meet, and that also that we are in close link with European counterparts. And so that's the role of Canada in this crisis, is really making sure that there's strong unity amongst allies, and that's the role we'll continue to play. Do you think what's going on in Ukraine right now, some of the pictures coming out, are crime against humanity? So, and that's exactly why uh, Canada has petitioned, along with many other countries, the International Criminal Court uh, to investigate and to make sure that, doc that, that there's a documentation linked to what is happening as we speak. Because when uh, the Russian regime and Putin are targeting civilians, clearly this is a war crime and this is a crime against humanity. So, so in 2005, as you, as you know, Canada was one of the, you know, the leading countries uh, when it came to United Nations agreement, uh, a responsibility to protect nations against crimes against humanity, against genocide. Uh, does Canada have a duty to do more on the ground? Well, that's exactly why we did so very, very early. Uh, I was in Geneva last week, actually, more than last week, two weeks ago, yeah. uh, and uh, and I announced it uh, at the same time pretty much as Lithuania, and we were the two first country to petition the ICC. Uh, we know we want to do more in the context of this process. Uh, my team and I are working very closely also with the ICC, and we'll continue to play a leadership role. This is true for the ICC, this is true also for another court that is important, which is the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. Uh, Ukraine has petitioned the ICJ um, against Russia, and we're supporting Ukraine, and we'll have more to say on that as well. Vladimir Putin seems more and more isolated as the weeks go by, uh, but there are some leaders that still have, uh, uh, you know, connections to him. They, they still have a line to the Kremlin. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what Canada is doing to work some of those diplomatic channels to the Kremlin? Well, it is important for us to have an ambassador in Moscow for that reason. It is important for us to know what is happening in, you know, in the Kremlin and in the political system in Russia. It is difficult to have access to information because you know that uh, Vladimir Putin has put a uh, very difficult laws in place regarding information, so more we're able to collect that information and afterwards give it to Canadians and to journalists. It is our way to make sure that we know what's going on the ground. On the diplomatic side, of course, like I mentioned to an earlier answer uh, question mm -hmm. to, of yours, we're working with the G7. Definitely we have the Five Eyes, which is important on the intelligence side, but we are coordinating with the G7 because they have other intelligence units. And that's where basically it is important for us to be aligned in our assessment of what's going on. We need to continue to have these diplomatic conversations. That's why the Prime Minister also is talking with Israel, with Turkey, and many other leaders that are playing a role in these diplomatic I, I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, and, and we were both together in Europe last week, and the Prime Minister was talking about sanctions and, and ramping up these sanctions, and, and the government has been uh, you know, talking about this for some time, but it does not seem to be uh, 
affecting Vladimir Putin's continued invasion of Ukraine. Were there any new ideas that uh, you developed when talking to some of the leaders in Europe in terms of what else can be done other than sanctions at this point? Well, I was talking with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Ukraine yesterday again, Mitro Kuleba, who became a good friend. And he said to me, you know, Melanie, the most important for us right now is that there are strong sanctions and that there are weapons. And Canada is the leading uh, country when it comes to both. Uh, so that's why sanctions are working. They are weakening the Russian regime. We have put maximum pressure on Russia, on different on different industries, clearly also the banking sector. We've closed our airspace. We've banned Russian ships from our ports. But we need to do more, and that's why also it is important to have conversation, like I said, within the G7. And at the same time, we need to provide weapons. That's what we're doing. And our uh, deliveries have been successful as well. I want to talk about President Vladimir Zelensky in a moment. But, yeah. but, but, but first, when it comes to the use of chemical weapons and when it comes to the use of nuclear weapons, I asked the Prime Minister whether or not that would be a red line. Um, and, and he didn't really answer the question. I'm asking you now, if Russia uses chemical or nuclear weapons on the people of Ukraine, what would the response be from the Canadian government? I'm not here to discuss potential scenarios, obviously, but... Is that a red line, though? For us, the red line has been always not to trigger an international war. That has been a red line. That is why, also, we've said that Article 5 cannot be triggered. If, trig if Article 5 would be triggered by Russia, then uh, NATO would respond. That has been a red line since the beginning, and that's why the Prime Minister, myself, every time you ask us yeah. a question, that will be our position. Um, at the same time, also, that's why in the context of the negotiations between Russia and Ukraine, it is fundamental that there be two things, a ceasefire negotiated and humanitarian corridors. And unfortunately, Russia has not been able to uh, support both of these conditions, and that is why also we're using everything within our diplomacy to isolate Russia, but also we're using international law to make sure to put pressure on Russia. On the humanitarian front, and we'll likely hear uh, you know, a lot on that front from President Zelensky, uh, but the, the, the President of Poland said that that country could see as many as five million refugees and they need countries like Canada to assist. And I know uh, that the Prime Minister said that we are going to be there in that effort. Uh, when it comes specifically to airlifts, are those going to happen? Well, we're having discussions regarding how to bring refugees to Canada. I was on Friday on a call again with my colleague, Minister of Immigration, Sean Fraser, and I've had many conversations with my counterparts in Germany and Poland because definitely these countries also need to be supported as they're welcoming so many refugees. Yeah. So we will play a role and we're in active conversations this well. We talked yesterday, last week about, uh, you know, how the pictures uh, matter, optics matter. Yeah, you asked uh, me a difficult question. I asked you a difficult and question. And I rejected that question. <laughs> we know that. You did indeed. Um, but, you know, th this is going to be certainly a show of solidarity, Canada yeah. and Ukraine today. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, you know, what is the commitment that you are going to be making to uh, President Zelensky after his address today in terms of Canada's commitment yeah. moving forward? So I think, first and foremost, we are supporting Pres President Zelensky showing a lot of courage, a lot of determination. Between you and I and all the folks that are watching us, a lot of uh, leaders in the world may have, have left uh, their country in such dire circumstances, but he didn't. He stayed, and he's a, he's a hero for Ukrainians, but also for the world. That being said it is important that we show him and his people our support because what is a, a threat to what is going on right now is a fatigue regarding the conflict that people around the world uh, become used to difficult atrocious pictures yeah. and and videos they're seeing and we can't normalize war that's not what we do in our country and that's not what we ought to be doing. And so the Canadian government can only act if Canadians 
are supporting our actions. And that's why President Zelensky's address to the nation today is so important, because he's talking, yes, to the House of Commons, but through us, he's speaking to Canadians. Okay. Minister Melanie Jolie, appreciate your time. I know you got to get in there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you for much. answering the tough questions last week as well. Uh, so, Suhanna, uh, that speech coming up at 11.15, we're going to continue to have full coverage right here on CBC News Network. Great discussion with the minister, and I did hear the bells ringing, and I can see people behind you as they head in for this historic moment. We will talk again, Travis, at CBC's Travis Danraj in Ottawa. And our chase team has also reached Roland Paris in our nation's capital. He's director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. He's also a former foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Roland, always great to have you on the program. If you were whispering into Trudeau's ear right now, what would you say? Make your message all about this when you speak in the House today before Zelensky. Well, I think it, it's, it doesn't take rocket science. This is going to be a message of solidarity that Trudeau is going to be expressing. I would expect uh, that Zelensky will thank Canada for its many years of support of, U uh, of Ukraine and for its current support, that he'll call for more, undoubtedly, as he has been uh, repeatedly. Uh, and uh, I think it'll be an inspiring speech because he's an inspiring figure and also a preview probably of what he'll be saying to the U.S. Congress uh, when he addresses that body tomorrow. We'll certainly be uh, carrying that live for our viewers right here on CBC News Network, so they will not miss a thing. We already heard in my uh, my colleague Travis Danraj was speaking with the Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie about those new sanctions from the government targeting individuals, 15 of them known to be, uh, I think the word was enablers, uh, supporting Vladimir Putin. Is that enough? Is, is there more to come? What else should we be doing? Yeah, I'm sure that there's more to come. I mean, the big picture here is that we've seen a level of unity and resolve from uh, Western allies and, and democracies elsewhere that uh, would have been very surprising even just a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and this is uh, Vladimir Putin's legacy, is that he's, uh, he's managed to rekindle the, the resolve and the solidarity of, of the democratic world, which had been flagging for a very long time. But of course, Canada can be doing more and other allies can be doing more. We could be providing more weapons to the Ukrainians. We could be putting more economic pressure on Vladimir Putin and those around him. And we could be providing more humanitarian aid and fast tracking the, uh, the arrival of Ukrainian refugees to Canada. Hmm. You know, there's always that analysis that uh, when a country is divided and polarized, a war will unite uh, people of that country. And we're certainly seeing, you know, Ukrainians uh, unite, uh, mothers and daughters uh, leaving uh, to go to safety, and fathers and sons, uh, uncles, et cetera, staying uh, to fight as civilians. Do you think then, give me more on how this has united the world in what can be very polarizing times? Well, I'm not sure it's united the entire world because we're seeing countries like China that are trying to essentially uh, keep their head down or Yeah, I'm leaving China provide... out of the mix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, what we've seen is countries like Germany suddenly decide that to discard its post World War II identity as a effectively a, a pacifist country and to recognize that hard power is now necessary in this new era that we're facing. And I think that it will have spillover. In a way, the silver lining here is that the democratic world has opened up, uh, has woken up mm -hmm. to the kinds of threats, not just from Russia, but potentially from elsewhere. And, you know, there are bigger questions for Canada to be asking even beyond this conflict. Are we prepared to invest in the kind of capabilities that we will need to defend our allies and to protect our security and sovereignty in North America? We have lived through a very long period of relative peace and security. Uh, we are unfortunately moving into a much more dangerous time and we need to be ready for it. When you were advising the prime ministers uh, in foreign policy, obviously, Roland, you were very uh, aware of discussions that were happening in other nations. So if you were to put that hat on now, as you uh, attempt to give me some understanding of what's happening behind those closed doors in the Kremlin, what are the conversations? What, what is the mentality happening in there? Well, you know, I could tell you more about or guess about what's happening behind closed doors among Western allies than within the Kremlin, because that's always been very difficult to penetrate. But my guess is that Vladimir Putin is relatively isolated. 
Uh, he surrounded himself with people who, uh, as we saw in public displays of meetings with his advisors, are have been cowed into in, into uh, fear and uh, into not uh, 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 contradicting him. I would expect that Vladimir Putin is absolutely furious about the performance of the Russian military in Ukraine. The advance I'm seems just gonna to have jump, been... I'm just going to jump in, Roland, for a moment, because the prime minister is speaking with reporters. I'll come back to you. We'll listen in live here on CBC News Network to Justin Trudeau. I'm very proud to hear him, but to be able to demonstrate our support complete and supported. Sir, in English, why, how can you refuse a no-fly zone at this point? What we're doing today is getting an opportunity to show how much Canadians are supportive of Ukraine and of President Zelensky, uh, while at the same time being able to hear uh, directly from him as he uh, speaks about what's happening in his, in his country and demonstrate that across party lines across the country we stand with Ukraine. I continue to speak with him regularly about uh, things that we can do, and we will continue to work on those. Merci tout le monde. All right, you heard the Prime Minister there. Sorry we didn't get translation out to you in time, but certainly sending that message of unity. And that's what we will hear, I suppose, when the Prime Minister addresses the House of Commons just before the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. I was speaking uh, just uh, before I so rudely interrupted him, Roland Paris, former for foreign policy advisor to the Prime Minister. But, Roland, you understand what happened there. I mean, the Prime Minister comes to the microphones. Of course, we want to get on that because we want to keep our viewers informed. And you're doing a great job of that. During during our conversation as well. I want to ask you about one thing. When we were talking about that expression of unity, and, and you know, not including China in that, but you talked about some of the changes in Germany. Uh, from the EU, is there enough strength coming? Because there are three leaders. I think it's uh, Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovenia. They're going into Kiev, which is under a 35-hour curfew, against the uh, advice of the other EU members. What does that tell you about unity, or, or is that even sort of breaking down? Well, I think that, I mean, they are there, they say, with the uh, approval of the, of the uh, European Union. I don't doubt it. Uh, and the European Union has already taken steps that we couldn't have imagined from the European Union. It, it, it has uh, essentially decided to, to spend hundreds of, of billions of dollars uh, for weapons for Ukraine. This is an organization that kind of represented a, a more peaceful world beyond conflict that is suddenly rediscovering the importance of hard power in the face of this kind of threat. But of course, there will be there will be uh, different points of view within the European Union and within NATO. And the countries that are closest to Russia are the ones that naturally are most fearful about the potential for a Russian uh, victory in Ukraine. So that's that's why you see those nearby country leaders taking the remarkable step of, tra of traveling to Kiev in the middle of this war zone. It, it will send a very, very strong message of solidarity. I want to thank you for your insight, Roland. And you be well. That is Roland Paris, former foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And as we stay on this during our special coverage here of the speech about to be made in the House of Commons by Ukrainian President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, I want to bring in another guest. Our chase team has connected with Colin Robertson in Sarasota, Florida. He's a former Canadian diplomat. He's been on our program before, also fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Colin, day 20 of the war in Ukraine. And on this day 20, a historic moment for Canada. Zelensky uh, speaking before uh, our House of Commons virtually. What will you be expecting from the Ukrainian president? Well, he's going to ask us to help. And he specifically wants arms and he wants us to be part of his role, which is saying the humanitarian relief effort. And we were there, but I think we could be doing more. You know, going forward in this this now, as you say, three-week-long conflict, which is going to go on, what Europe is going to need and what Ukraine is going to need, it will be fuel and food. And that's two things Canada can provide. But I think we're going to have to ramp ourselves up. I, as Roland said, I think that we're into a different era. The globalization as we knew it, the, the world order that we gave us peace and relative security for 75 years, I think that's going to have, need a rethink. But uh, at, a, at a first point, we're going to have to uh, help our allies with basic commodities that we have in Canada. And I think that means we're going to have to consider putting the country on the kind of war footing we did during World War II when we really ramped up and 
moved from being basically an agricultural society to an industrial society. C.D. Howe was the famous minister of the day. We need another C.D. Howe to get mm. the country galvanized to be able to support because there, there, is, there are going to be shortages of, of food and fuel, not just in Europe, but around the world. And will, will Canada be able to show its strength that way? While we may not have the military firepower, we are sending lethal weapons, et cetera, et cetera, training of, uh, you know, military personnel there. But when it comes to humanitarian aid, is this the country with heart? Yeah, it is. I mean, what we do in this country is we take people in. We're, we're the, the home for the, the used to be the United States. The United States will still play that role, but there's a kind of pushback in the U.S., for a variety of reasons, this flow from the South, but not Canada. Across every party, there is strong support to, to bring in more immigrants and to bring in uh, refugees, as long as they meet our kind of security rules and they pass the, the, the medical fitness tests. And so we'll be doing that. Uh, that's how this country was built. And I, I do think that's going to be a big, big role going forward if people choose to come here. And of course, we've got close to 4% of this country with roots from Ukraine, including members of parliament like Christopher Freeland, like James. And so I do think that you're already seeing, you look at the cities across Canada, you've been reporting on it, this extraordinary outflow within, from Canadians, people thought there was compassion fatigue. That's not the case. People really care. And the pictures that you're showing, I think is what touches the heartstrings mm -hmm. of Canadians. I have about a minute left, Colin. I just want to ask you one further question. And this is, as a diplomat, is diplomacy working in any way, shape, or form here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, it is what they, what they need is hard power. But yes, diplomacy is working. We saw yesterday uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, meeting with his Chinese counterpart in Rome. The fact that the, the leaders of uh, three East European countries are going to Kiev. I mean, this is all diplomacy. The fact that President Macron is trying to still reach Vladimir Putin. The fact that the, the Chinese are talking to the Russians, mm -hmm. the, the Turks, the Israelis. Yeah, diplomacy is, is going to be our way out. Somehow we have to find an off-ramp out of this solution. But it really does come down to one man, uh, Sue Hannah, and that's mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin. We're all watching, and uh, I thank you for your time, Colin. Colin Robertson in Sarasota, Florida. He's a former Canadian diplomat. <laughs>
I mean, we have seen President Zelensky do this before, obviously, in the United Kingdom and, and most recently in Poland last week, and he's set to speak to the United States tomorrow to Congress. So this is really about uh, the president uh, making sure that NATO allies and countries are doing enough for him. I would expect to hear from him very specific asks about more support that, he, that is needed uh, for Ukraine in the form of military equipment, certainly, but also that consideration that has been put on the table a handful of times now by him around a no-fly zone. Um, it is obviously a, 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 a sort of a, a dramatic moment for uh, for Parliament and for President Zelensky. And given Canada's close ties to Ukraine, um, a really important moment for lots of Canadians to hear directly from him. He has been given impassioned pleas and speeches in incredibly different, difficult circumstances. And this is really about him trying to keep the pressure on allies in order to uh, this is really in order to uh, make sure that he continues that pressure and that allies stay on the same page here. Yes, we're expecting to hear the word unity uh, a lot during this entire discussion from all of the speakers. And Vasi, I know that you spoke to Ukraine's former president. He was actually in Canada back in 2014 to address Parliament. You've got some news from that interview. What did he say? Yeah, it was really interesting. I think you were discussing it with both Colin and uh, Roland there, the idea of the three prime ministers from Eastern European countries coming to visit Kyiv, even though it is in the middle, of course, of, of an assault by Russian forces and, and the imagery of that and the significance of that. And actually, Mr. Poroshenko highlighted that as well and then followed it up by saying, I really want to invite your prime minister, Justin Trudeau, to also visit here because it is necessary for him to be able to, and I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially understand to the full degree, which he should or he could, uh, what we are going through and the, the assault that we are facing uh, by Russia. So that was very interesting. I also had the opportunity to ask him to reflect on his visit to Canada to address Parliament, much in the same way, except not virtually in person, back in 2014. Uh, that was uh, uh, following and in the middle of Russia's annexation of Crimea. Uh, here's what Mr. Poroshenko had to say about the fact that eight years later, Ukraine's next president has to do the same thing, facing a, a, a much more serious but also, uh, you know, equally troubling battle. We have, we are one people, free, people of the free and democratic world. We demonstrate a lot of unity. In the year, in the one of the most difficult years of my history, in the year 2014, when we don't have an army, the Canada was together uh, with me, and then Prime Minister Harper and the bo bipartisan support in the Canadian Parliament maybe save a lot of life of Ukrainian. And now you should understand our fight is your fight. Our uh, security is your security, and we're fighting here for the freedom and security of Canadian people. And that's why you are not assisting Ukraine. You are not helping Ukraine. You investing in your security. And uh, the weaker Putin would be because of the action of Ukrainian armed forces, the better it would be for the global security. And that's why we need to stop this crazy maniac with the nuclear bomb. That's why we should put it behind the bars in the Hague Tribunal for the thousands and thousands of this Ukrainian he killed on our soil. And definitely, this is completely unpredictable. And this person, Putin, understands only language of first. And the more quicker you help, the closer would be the victory. If you delay the help, that would cost to Ukrainian people new lost lives, tons of blood, and danger for the sovereignty and territorial integrity. This is true. Two things really jump out at me from that answer, Suhanna. The first, the uh, the weight that Mr. Poroshenko places on the help Canada provided back in 2014, and therefore the ask for help, as Rosie was talking about, we can expect from President Zelensky today, the, the, uh, the extra pressure, the extra ask for more of that help. But also what struck me was the way in which Mr. Poroshenko framed that help, right? Not as help, instead as an investment in our own security, because he is so certain that this is not sort of the end of Putin's uh, aggression, but, but rather the start of something else that would more directly involve uh, Canada and our allies. 
Uh, and uh, Rosemary, if I could ask you, uh, in that support comes sanctions. And we did hear uh, Travis Danraj, our colleague, speaking with Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie. 15 more people they call enablers of Putin's war in Ukraine having sanctions. But then, as I understand it, 370 more sanctions on people coming out of the UK. Is there pressure on Canada to, to, you know, to match those numbers as well in order to do everything it can to help Ukraine? Yeah, well, Canada is is coordinating very closely with the United Kingdom, the U.S., and other NATO allies. We're actually up to 500 individuals and entities from uh, Russia, Belarus, and even Ukraine who have sanctions placed upon them. Uh, that's since this incursion began, began. But since the annexation of Crimea, I believe Canada has something close to 900 people on that list. So this is done uh, very much in concert. And it's a coordinated effort. Otherwise, sanctions don't really work if mm -hmm. everyone's not doing them and placing them on the same individuals. So you saw some of those similar names again today that was on that list of new newly sanctioned people from uh, Canada today. You know, I, I think there is some evidence the sanctions are working. We are starting to see some effect on, on the richest people in, in Russia and the people closest to Vladimir Putin. I guess, though, sanctions tend to take some time. And what Ukraine does not have right now is time. Um, so is there anything else Canada can do to sort of ratchet up the pressure on Putin? The other thing that Melanie Jolie said in that interview is that we are providing military equipment. That is true. Uh, we, we are sending in what we can, and we are also using NATO allies in order to get some of those weapons there. We have increased the number of people we have in Latvia, soldiers we have on the ground in Latvia. We've committed uh, to an indeterminate amount of time on the ground in Latvia, and we have 3,400 soldiers on standby if indeed this does escalate into something much uh, graver for the rest of the world. So there are lots of things that are happening, but can Canada can only, I think, do so much in this. Um, and so there will be a lot of pressure and, and focus, I think, tomorrow on the speech that President Zelensky gives to Congress mm -hmm. and to see whether there will be a different response from President Biden tomorrow as well. And we were certainly listening. We carried it for our viewers when uh, President Zelensky addressed the British House of Commons. And as you've said, he is speaking with other foreign governments as well in, in similar scenarios. Um, so. Our, uh, the, the way our uh, government is, wor is working it is that it's going to start with the prime minister and then I believe the president of Ukraine. There are also going to be uh, opposition leaders who will have time to speak. Rosemary, what are you expecting to hear from them? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those moments, uh, Suhanna, where we're politicians are united. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it will be important that people uh, express that unity towards Ukraine. I don't think we should exp expect President Zelensky to stick around very long. Uh, he is doing this virtually. He is doing it uh, from, I would imagine, a, a secure location because his own life is in jeopardy. So he is taking some risk uh, by doing this. Um, and, and it will be a chance for other parliamentarians to pronounce themselves on the state of, of what NATO is doing and what Canada should be doing more of. I, I think this is one of those moments where Parliament should and could co and, and should come together uh, and express that show of support and solidarity for Ukraine. Vashi, what will you be listening for from the opposition leaders uh, as they take to the microphone as well? Yeah, I, I think along, along the si same lines as Rosie. I don't anticipate there to be many partisan cleavages in the response. I think for the most part, other than some minor differences over whether or not, for example, lethal aid should be supplied or the degree to which Canada could or should help uh, refugees fleeing Ukraine, everyone is basically on the same page. What Russia is doing is wrong. We need to help Ukraine to the fullest of our ability. Uh, they're not going to be speaking for an inordinate amount of time, so I don't expect a lot of meat on that bone. But, but I certainly do and, and expect, like Rosie said, al alongside what we've seen in other addresses Zelensky has given to other political bodies, uh, you know, everyone is pretty united in their condemnation of what Russia's doing and expressing support in uh, what Mr. Zelensky, what President Zelensky is mm -hmm. asking for. Uh, I expect everybody to applaud when he makes the extra asks around, for example, the no-fly zone. But I do think that, again, there are some some cleavages there. I just don't expect them to be highlighted through the, the speeches following his address. We're all waiting to hear from uh, the president of Ukraine. Rosemary Vashi, I'll just ask you to be on hold for a moment. I want to take our viewers live to outside of the House of Commons where we've got CBC's Travis Danraj standing by. Travis, when you were doing your interview with uh, Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie, I heard the bells ringing. There were MPs, ministers who were walking by. I'm just wondering what the mood is there, if you could describe that for me, and if you've been hearing any of the, you know, the conversation around you as they pre prep for this speech. Yeah, well, I can tell you two colors that I have certainly seen a lot of Suhana. That's blue 
and Diallo. Yes. Uh, you know, the gallery is, is full of Ukrainian Canadians and those that have connections to Ukraine today. I, I was on the phone late last night and I talked to her this morning with Chantal Kravyazek, you know, uh, a famous singer songwriter who has roots in Ukraine uh, and family still there, in fact. And she was telling me about being here and kind of feeling helpless watching these pictures. She is helping with the aid effort. And so this moment is, is as you know, Rosemary and both Vashi said, going to unify the country. And it is one of those rare moments where that happens here. Um, but you are really seeing that there is solidarity uh, right across the country for Ukraine, uh, across political stripes. But you know what Zelensky asks for in terms of real substance, um, we shall certainly see. It, you know, uh, a lot of people are saying that it cannot just be talk, cannot just be shows of solidarity. Uh, the, you know, there, there, there's more that needs to happen when it comes to uh, the humanitarian situation and also militarily and the aid that is going there. Certainly the prime minister has said, uh, and you heard him today again, uh, talk a little bit about what Canada has done so far. I pushed Melanie Jolie on, you know, whether or not we could see airlifts of refugees out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that announcement not coming just yet, but it looks as though they're going in that direction. I also asked her a little bit, Suhanna, about whether or not we could see NATO leaders meet as soon as next week in Brussels, uh, a, a show of support and solidarity from all NATO leaders. Of course, the prime minister in Europe last week to meet with some of them. But wouldn't that be something if all the NATO leaders came together uh, to stand up against the Kremlin and show support for Vladimir Zelensky. We are just moments away from that all beginning exactly where you are at the House of Commons at CBC's Travis Danraj in Ottawa. We will talk again. And uh, we've got standing by also in our nation's capital. CBC's chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton will be listening in and Power and Politics host Vashi Kapelos. For viewers just joining us, Rosemary, walk me through the significance of this moment that is going to begin and unfold in the House in just a few minutes. Well, I mean, as you've been saying, first of all, it is an address that's happening virtually, obviously, because President Zelensky is, is not going to leave his country mm -hmm. and is not going to leave the battle uh, for his country right now. So that is significant. This is not, obviously, the first time a foreign leader has, has spoken uh, inside Parliament. This, this happens uh, for momentous occasions. It doesn't often happen during war times. Uh, I'm not sure if the last time might be Winston Churchill when he came to Canada back in 1941 and addressed Parliament in a very famous speech. But these are often uh, important moments in in, in history to for Canadians, for Canadian parliamentarians to register uh, what they want the government to do in, show, uh, in a show of support. I would say it is more than symbolic. Um, it, it, it does actually also put pressure on the government. You heard ta Travis talking about what we've done in terms of humanitarian and military aid. Just last week, the prime minister announced another $50 million on that front. So they are having to actually put uh, action behind their words. Um, and it, it is a historic moment for for this country and for the many many Ukrainian Canadians who live here who are wanting to hear this man who has become in many ways a hero for his country uh, at a critical moment and Vashi Capello's uh, viewers have been hearing us talk about this 1115 timeline Eastern when the president of uh, Ukraine is going to address our parliament beginning of course with uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau but you did an interview with the former president and for those viewers who are tuning in right now there was an interesting message coming Coming from uh, the former president saying our fight is your fight our security is your security not making this about Ukraine and Russia but about you know all of us uh, in the Western world and in the free world if you will and the fight being or that mantle having to be carried by all of us what did you take away from that interview yeah, which is really the central message from President Zelensky, too, in the addresses he has made to the UK Parliament, to Congress before that, and, and I'm sure to Congress again tomorrow morning. It's it's fascinating because actually Porsche, Mr. Poroshenko, the president you're refer, uh, re referencing, as well as uh, Mr. Zelensky, they're actually like major political foes, right? Incre I can't even go into the amount of detail there is about how at odds they were prior to this. But this has completely banded them together in their messaging. And you're, you're right. What Mr. Poroshenko's key message was and what Mr. Mr. Zelensky's message, I imagine, will be is, this is not just limited to the borders of Ukraine, even though NATO and, our, and its allies have been very clear in that that is where the fight exists right now. They have no doubt, Mr. Poroshenko said he has no doubt that, and he called Putin a maniac, will go beyond the borders of Ukraine. And therefore, the help that we offer Ukraine, be it lethal, be it humanitarian, be it more, as Mr. Zelensky is asking for, 
is not just about helping a country that is suffering, but about preventing what could happen in this country or could happen in other countries uh, of which NATO is a, uh, that belong rather to, mm -hmm. to NATO. And so, you know, his line around it's not helping, it's investing in your own security. Uh, and so I think that will be a theme, and that will be something that we hear from Mr. Zelensky. If it's your own security, what are you willing to put forth? What kind of aid are you willing to offer? If it's not just about helping Ukraine, does that increase the ask and increase the willingness of, of countries like Canada as to what they're, what they're able or willing to put forward? Vashi, I'm still looking at the green screen, just informing us that coming up uh, in uh, our House of Commons is the address to Parliament by the Ukrainian president. So, Rosemary, let me ask you in this time that we do have about uh, the efforts of diplomacy, because while, uh, you know, we might hear fighting words uh, from uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, there are diplomatic talks happening, another round virtually between, uh, you know, members of, of, uh, from Russia and and. and officials from Ukraine. What are you going to be watching for to come out of the diplomacy as we hear some of the tough words that we will from Zelensky today? Well, I mean, I, I mean, they have failed to date. I, I, I think it's always good for diplomatic talks to continue because there has to be some way out of this. That's what everyone's hope is. But uh, Russia has uh, made many promises over the course of these past 20 days and then reneged entirely on them, whether it be humanitarian corridors or how it would approach uh, getting aid and supplies into Ukrainians still on the ground. So um, perhaps that's the, the pessimist in me, not thinking that there much will come out of these talks but I, I suppose it's a good thing that the two sides remain in conversation. What is probably more significant are the ongoing conversations that are having that are being had um, directly with Vladimir Putin, whether it be Emmanuel Macron or others, and particularly China as well. We know that there's been a, an increasing amount of pressure now on China to condemn what is happening in Russia, Hans Stoltenberg saying that at NATO headquarters again today. Um, Canada's role in the diplomatic talks is obviously perhaps not as powerful, but it does believe that it can be a conduit between mm -hmm. uh, different parts of the world. I want to thank you both. Uh, CBC's chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, and also host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos, both of us, both of them joining us from our nation's capital. Here begins our special. We are waiting for an address by Ukrainian Prime Minister Volodymyr Zelensky. This is the House of Commons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cher parlementaire, Amis et collègues. Bonjour et merci d'être Good morning and thank you for being here today to welcome a courageous and exceptional leader. President Zelensky, on behalf of parliamentarians and on behalf of all Canadians, it is an honour to welcome you to our House. Mr. President, Volodymyr, you are a friend. Canadians and Ukrainians are friends, and they have been for a long time. Our people share deep historical ties. In the early 20th century, a massive wave of Ukrainian immigrants came to Canada. Many of them settled in the Canadian prairies. They worked the land. They built churches distinguished by their beautiful spires. And they helped shape Canada in significant ways. Notre pays Today, there are 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians in our country, making it the second largest Ukrainian diaspora in the world, whether as farmers, producers, scientists, community leaders, athletes or frontline workers, Ukrainian Canadians continue to make a tremendous contribution to our country. But the friendship between Canada and Ukraine is not only based on this shared history, it is also based on our shared values. Volodymyr, in the years I've known you, I've always thought of you as a champion for democracy. And now, democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion.
Your courage and the courage of your people inspires us all. You're defending the right of Ukrainians to choose their own future. And in doing so, you're defending the values that form the pillars of all free democratic countries. Freedom, human rights, justice, truth, international order. These are the values you're risking your life for as you fight for Ukraine and Ukrainians. Beyond that, you're inspiring democracies and democratic leaders around the world to be more courageous, more united, and to fight harder for what we believe in. You remind us that friends are always stronger together. With allies and partners, we're imposing crippling sanctions to make sure Putin and his enablers in Russia and Belarus are held accountable. Today, in line with our European Union partners, I can announce that we have imposed severe sanctions on 15 new Russian officials, including government and military elites who are complicit in this illegal war. Canada will continue to support Ukraine with military equipment, as well as financial and humanitarian assistance. And we will be there to help rebuild once the aggressor is repelled. In Canada, we like to root for the underdog. We believe that when a cause is just and right, it will always prevail, no matter the size of the opponent. This doesn't mean it'll be easy. Ukrainians are already paying incalculable human costs. This illegal and unnecessary war is a grave mistake, and Putin must stop it now. Vladimir Putin's blatant disregard for human life is absolutely unacceptable. Canada continues to demand that Russia stop targeting civilians and end this unjustifiable war. Ukrainians are standing up to authoritarianism. And as parliamentarians united in this House today, and all Canadians, we stand with you. As friends, you can count on our unwavering and steadfast support. And now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you all the President of Ukraine, our friend, Volodymyr Zelensky. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, dear Justin, members of the government, members of the parliament, all distinguished guests, friends. Before I begin, I would like you to understand my feelings and feelings of all Ukrainians as far as it is possible. Our feelings over the last 20 days, 20 days of a full-scale aggression of Russian Federation after eight years of fightings in Donbass region. Can you only imagine? Imagine that on the on 4 a.m. each of you you start hearing bomb explosions, severe explosions. Justin, can you imagine hearing you, your children, hear all these severe explosions, bombing of airport, bombing of Ottawa airport, tens of other cities of your wonderful country? Can you imagine that? 
cruise, cruise missiles are being falling down and you're tearing it. And your children are asking you what happened. And you are receiving the first news which infrastructure objects have been bombed and destroyed by Russian Federation. And you know how many people already died. Can you only imagine what words, how can you explain to your children that you just uh, full-scale aggression just happened in your country. You know that this is war to annihilate your state, your country. You know that this is the war to subjugate your people. And on second day, you receive uh, notifications that huge columns of military equipment are entering your country, crossing the border. They're entering small cities. They are giving siege. They're encircling cities. And, and they start to shell civil neighborhoods. They bomb school buildings. They destroyed kindergarten facilities. Like in our city, city of Sumy, like in city of Ohtyrka. Imagine that someone is taking siege, laying siege to Vancouver. Can you just imagine them for a second? And all these people who are left in such city. And this is exactly the situation that our city of Mariupol is suffering right now. Too. And they are left without heat or hydro, or without means of communicating, almost without food, without water, seeking shelter in bomb shelters. Dear Justin, Dear guests, can you imagine that every day you receive memorandums about the number of casualties, including among women and children? You've heard about the bombings. Currently, we have 97 children that died during this war. Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. Of course, I don't wish this on anyone, but this is our reality in which we live. We have to contemplate, we have to see where the next bombing will take place. Your church is square. We have a freedom square in the city of of in the city of Harden, our Babin Yar, the place where uh, uh, victims of Holocaust were buried, and they, they, it has been bombed by the Russians. Imagine that Canadian facilities have been bombed, similarly as our buildings and memorial places are being bombed. A number of families have died. Every night is a horrible night. Russians are shelling from all kinds of artillery, from tanks. They're hitting civilian infrastructure. They're hitting big buildings. Uh, can you imagine that there is a uh, fire starting at a nuclear power plant, and that's exactly what happened in our country. Each city that they are marching through, they are taking down Ukrainian flags. Can you imagine someone taking down your Canadian flags in Montreal and other Canadian cities? I know that you all support Ukraine. We've been friends with you, Justin, but also I would like you to understand and I would like you to feel this, what we feel every day. We want to live and we want to be victorious. We want to prevail for the sake of life. Can you imagine when you, when you call your friends, your friendly nation, and you ask, please close the sky? Close the airspace. Please stop the bombing. How many more cruise missiles have to fall on our cities until you make this happen? And they, in return, they express their deep concerns about the situation. When we talk to with our partners and they say, please hold on, hold on a little longer. 
спокойный. Просто хочет... А кто шукает причины? Сам... Some people are talking about trying to avoid the escalation. And at the same time, in response to our aspiration to become members of nature, we also do not hear a clear answer. Sometimes we don't see obvious things. It's a, it's a dire strait, but it also allowed us to see who our real friends are over the last 20 days, and as well eight previous years. I am sure that you've been able to see clearly what's going on, and I'm addressing all of you. Canada has always been steadfast in their support. It's, you've been a reliable partner to Ukraine and Ukrainians, and I'm sure this will continue. You've offered your help, your system, at the, our earliest request. You supply us with the military assistance, with humanitarian assistance. You've imposed severe sanctions, serious sanctions. At the same time, we see that, unfortunately, this does, they did not bring the end to the war. You, see, you can see that our cities like Kharkiv, Mariupol, and many other cities are not protected just like your cities are protected, Edmonton, Vancouver. You can see that Kyiv is being shelled and bombed, Ivano-Frank city, ivano Frankivsk. It used to be, we were a very peaceful country, peaceful cities, but now they're being constantly bombarded. bombarded. Basically, what I'm trying to say that we all need to do, you all need to do more to stop Russia, to protect Ukraine, and by doing that, to protect Europe from Russian threat. They're destroying everything, memorial complexes, schools. Uh, hospitals, uh, uh, housing complex. They already killed 97 Ukrainian children. We are not asking for much. We are asking for justice, for real support, which will help us to prevail, to defend, to save life, to save life all of the world. Canada is leading in these efforts, and I am hoping that other countries will follow the same suit. We are asking for more of you your leadership, and please take more, uh, greater part in these efforts. Justin and all of our friends of, our, of Ukraine, all friends of the truth, uh, please understand how important it is for us to close our airspace from Russian missiles and Russian aircrafts. I hope you can understand. I hope you can increase your efforts, you can increase sanctions so they, don't, so they will not have a single dollar to fund their war effort. Uh, commercial entities should not be working in Russia. Probably you know better than many in any other countries that this attack on Ukraine, it's an, their attempt to annihilate Ukrainian people, and there is nothing else to it. This is their main objective. It's actually the war against Ukrainian people. And it's an attempt to destroy everything that we as Ukrainians do. It's an attempt to destroy our future, to destroy our nation, our character. You Canadians, you know very well all this. That's why I'm asking you, please do not stop in your efforts. Please expand your efforts to bring back peace in our peaceful country. I believe, and I know that you can do it, and we are building, we are part of the anti-war coalition, and jointly I'm sure that we'll achieve results. I would like to also ask our Ukrainian diaspora in Canada. This is a historical moment, and we need your support, your practical support. And we hope that with your practical steps you will show that you are part of the modern Ukrainian history. 
Please remember, this is a practical modern day history of Ukraine. We want to live, we want to have peace. I am grateful to everyone of you in the Parliament of Canada who is present there, to every Canadian citizen. I am very grateful to you, Justin. I am grateful to Canadian people. And I am confident that together we will overcome and will be victorious. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you to Canada. Thank you, Mr. President. I now invite the Honourable George Fury, Speaker of the Senate, to say a few words. President Zelensky, Prime Minister Trudeau, Chief Justice Van Heer, Speaker Rhoda, fellow parliamentarians, distinguished guests, mesdames et messieurs. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, it is a great honor and privilege for me to thank you for your very powerful and inspiring words. On behalf of all senators, members of the House of Commons, and indeed, on behalf of all Canadians, it is my honor and privilege to thank you for your very powerful and inspiring words today. Please know, Mr. President, that Canadians stand with you. We know what is at stake. You are battling for your people, for your country, 
and for all of us who believe in peace and democracy, in truth and justice. For all of us who stand against tyranny, lies, and the horrific war crimes that have been committed against the Ukrainian people. There is a word in the Bible, one word, that expresses so much of the courage that you, Mr. President, and your fellow Ukrainians are showing the world. In the original Hebrew, the word is hineni. Literally, it means, here I stand. It, it was said by the great Old Testament leaders when called upon to lead their people. It is a statement of stepping up to leadership in the face of overwhelming odds. It is clearly what you are saying, Mr. President, by your actions and what all Ukrainians are saying in this terrible time of crisis. The world is witnessing a Ukraine united more than ever in common cause to secure its place among the family of nations. As Prime Minister Trudeau has made clear by his words and actions, Canada stands with you. I know I speak on behalf of all Canadians when I express our admiration for the leadership and courage you have demonstrated as the Ukrainian people struggle to repel a brutal and illegal invasion. You have shown the world that Ukraine will not cower, will not falter, and will not be defeated. The heart and soul of Ukraine are strong. Canada recognizes your fortitude, your resilience, and your strength of purpose. Canada stands with Ukraine and her many allies in the pursuit of a swift and peaceful resolution to this conflict. This resolve rests upon our shared commitment to democracy, to human rights, and to the sovereign equality of all nations. For Canadians, Ukraine is permanently woven into the fabric of our culture. Ukraine, simply put, is family. Mr. President, to you and the people of Ukraine, please be assured of our solidarity in the days and weeks ahead. Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour votre... Thank you, Mr. President, for your great strength and your great courage. Thank you once again for your courage and determination in the face of this horrific onslaught and for your inspiring words to Canada and indeed to the world today. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, Speaker Fury. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, most of all, most of us rather can only imagine the hardship, the sorrow and the fear that the people of Ukraine are enduring as their nation is attacked and their very existence is threatened. The extraordinary courage and defiance that Ukrainians are demonstrating in defending their country and their way of life is an example to all freedom-loving people. And it is clear that many, our, that many of our fellow citizens are drawing strength from your own determination to repel the invaders and protect your homeland. You are not just the president anymore. You have proven to be a great leader of your nation. As Ukraine continues to fight for its freedom, please know that you are not alone and that you will not be left behind. We will be there with you. We may be distant cousins in terms of geography, but Ukraine is woven into the very fabric of Canadian society, thanks to, to more than a million Canadians of Ukrainian descent. In an interview you gave two years ago, you said, and I quote, we must remember the heroes of today, heroes of the arts, Heroes of literature, simply heroes of Ukraine. Why don't we use their names, the names of the heroes that today unite Ukraine? To the people of Ukraine, to your friends in Canada, 
and around the world. You, Vladimir Zelensky, are one of those heroes. Heroyam Slava. Au nom de tous les parlementaires. On behalf of all parliamentarians, thank you for having addressed the people of Canada and for showing us the true meaning of courage, freedom and patriotism. May we prove worthy of the friendship between our people and our countries. Slava Ukraini. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Dziękuję. I now invite the Honourable Candice Bergen, Interim Leader of the Official Opposition, to address us. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to begin by first and foremost stating on behalf of my Conservative Caucus our complete admiration and respect for the people and the nation of Ukraine. And to President Zelensky, let me express to you how much I admire your courage and your sacrificial leadership at this critical time in Ukraine's history. The kind of leadership that you are showing, sir, is very rare, and it serves as an inspiration to all of us who are elected. You are the leader of Ukraine for such a time as this, and we remain indebted to you. Monsieur le Président Zelensky, merci pour votre leadership. President Zelensky, thank you for your leadership in this war against your country and your defense of democracy. The official opposition stands with Ukraine. It is our duty. We will also be there after this conflict in order to help you rebuild Ukraine. Your courage inspires us. The images that we are seeing from Ukraine, as you described them, President, are heartbreaking and painful. Families huddled in bomb shelters, the ruins of a children's hospital and a maternity ward, the elderly, elderly who are trying to find their way to safety. But there is also inspiration as we watch ordinary people, men and women of all ages, defending their homeland. We are witnesses to the strength and the defiance of Ukrainians standing up for their freedom, their independence and their sovereignty. Ukrainians aren't just fighting to defend themselves. Let's be very clear. They are defending all of Europe because Putin's brutal attack on Ukraine is an attack on all of us. That's the lesson history has taught us and one we cannot ignore. must help the people of Ukraine in every way possible. Canada has the largest number of people of Ukraine descent outside of Ukraine and Russia. For a century, they have enriched our communities and our culture, our, our culture, especially in the Canadian prairies, which is where I am from. Canada, and Manitoba in particular, share ties with Ukraine that cannot be broken. And now, almost 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians are watching what is happening. Their hearts and their souls are reaching out, hoping, praying for the nation and the people of their forebears. This war of naked aggression has revealed Vladimir Putin for what he really is, a warmonger and a violent predator with no regard for human life and suffering. He has crossed lines that after two world wars we thought would never be crossed and he's shaken the rule-based order that has kept millions safe since 1945. Every day, he tells the world lies, and then he proceeds to kill innocent and vulnerable Ukrainians, including women and children. And while on his rampage, he continues to threaten the world, saying if he doesn't get his way, he will use the worst extremes possible. It's sickening to watch. Putin must be brought to justice. He must be held to account for his crimes against humanity at the International Criminal Court at The Hague.
This is not just a war against Ukraine, it is a war against the free democratic world. We must stand with Ukraine. It is not a choice, it is a moral duty. Canada was the first country to recognize Ukraine's independence from the Soviet Union. Now it's time to honor that legacy. We must do more together with our allies to secure Ukraine's airspace. We need to protect protect at a minimum the airspace over the humanitarian corridors so that Ukrainians can seek safe passage away from the war zones and to allow humanitarian relief to reach those areas under siege. Canada must do whatever it can to cut through any red tape and welcome Ukrainians who are fleeing. Although we all know that what Ukrainians want most is to be able to live in their home nation free, sovereign and peaceful. President Zelensky. I want to reassure you that Canada will be a safe haven for Ukraine citizens who choose to come here until the battle is over. Yeah, yeah. While they are in Canada, we will cherish them, care for them, provide for them purpose and hope, and when it is time, they will return to their beloved Ukraine and their families. This is our pledge to you. Let me conclude by saying simply, Canadians support you today as you face Putin and his reckless empire building. Conservatives stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine and we will continue to support you when this terrible conflict finally ends and you rebuild your homes and communities. Your courage and faith and your fortitude in the face of adversity are an inspiration to all of us. Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. Keep fighting, keep believing, keep hoping. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bergen. I now ask the leader of the Bloc Québécois, Mr. Yves-François Blanchet, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Esteemed colleagues, Mr. Speaker, and especially Mr. President, it is difficult for me today to express myself in simple words that cannot carry or express all the sadness, all the indignation, all the anger roused by the dirty war inflicted on your great nation, on your great people. It is difficult for me to admit to a certain powerlessness as well, a powerlessness to do much more than express our compassion our desire, which is only a shadow of yours, to wake us all up from this nightmare that inhabits our screens on a daily basis. Of course, the Quebec nation, it is safe to say, I believe, is massively behind you, massively behind your people. Of course, we have asked and support the will that Canada act in the only valid way in concert with the free countries of this world and with major international organizations, whether economic, military or humanitarian. Of course, we also call for ever more severe economic sanctions. This so that it is from within Russia itself, through balanced negotiations, that the senseless aggression will come to an end. We strongly urge the Canadian government to ease the obstacles to welcoming refugees from Ukraine, in Quebec and in Canada. There are people, there are families, there is the diaspora, that wishes to welcome these refugees. 
We also need a humanitarian bridge between your territory and ours. It is with dismay that we have also heard your call for more weapons. You are entitled to them. You need them. The Quebec nation is peaceful. The Ukrainian nation is peaceful. I am convinced that it is with reluctance that you have asked for these weapons. Your people have the right to defend those they love. They have the right to defend this land that is theirs. So yes, Mr. President, let's arm the Ukrainians rapidly and more significantly. Mr. President, all this is still too little. Too little every time a man, a woman, or a child dies, every time a hospital, a daycare center, a school, a park, or even a single flower is destroyed. Every time, Mr. President, every time we are told that we have done too little, and in a way, we've done it too late. I would like to believe, Mr. President, that we must distinguish between the people and those who lead them. I would like to believe that the Russian people are the first victims of the Kremlin's dictator. But there are leaders of various kinds who do speak for their people, and there is no doubt that you are one. You have turned one of the enemy's worst weapons against itself, the powerful, the vicious, the petty machine of deception and disinformation of the Kremlin wanted to impose the false narrative of a history rewritten by the dictator for his own benefit and for his own personal glory. On the contrary, through simplicity, through frankness, through courage. You have touched the whole world. You kept the eyes of the world upon your people. And in doing so, you were able to, and you still have to insist upon, obtaining help that perhaps would have otherwise escaped you. You see, Mr. President, what we cannot do what we cannot do is the cruelest thing of all. Live through this despicable war in dark basements, shaken by the tremors of bombs dropped on your towns and on your villages. Fear for those you love. Doubt in the future. Dread regarding a reconstruction that will last at least a generation fear itself. Against the fear in the hearts of Ukraine's children, we can only do too little. I apologize for that. Your enemy, Mr. President, has neither the heart, nor the strength, nor the courage, nor the dignity to overcome the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Mr. President Zelensky, you will win. Freedom will be restored to you. And in its modest way, Quebec will celebrate with Ukraine. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Blanchet. Like the leader of the New Democratic Party, Mr. Jagmeet Singh, to speak to us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank President Zelensky. We heard his words today. We want to thank him for his courage, his inspiration, his resilience. We want to thank the people of Ukraine for their courage and their resilience. He asked us to imagine what it's like to wake up four in the morning to bombing. He asked us to imagine what it's like to explain to his to children. What does it mean? What is going on? Why are we being bombed? Why are we being attacked? 
He asked us to imagine what it would be like to lose 97 children to a war. He asked us to imagine if major cities in our country, major cities and major places that we think about, think about Montreal and Ottawa, our capital city, Toronto, Vancouver, he asked us to imagine what it would be like if tanks rolled into these cities. What would it be like to see bombs fall on our homes and our cities and our communities, on schools, on hospitals? He asked us to imagine that, and frankly, we can't imagine that. Sitting in Canada, it is unimaginable. But we've seen the horrors unfolding in Ukraine. We've heard the words of President Zelensky. We have spoken with Ukrainian Canadians who share with us the pain that they're experiencing right now, not knowing if their loved ones are going to survive the night. We've heard from families that call constantly asking, are you okay? Are you still alive? It is unimaginable for us. And he asked us, imagine what it's like and please help. He asked for more help. He acknowledged that so far Canada has been a strong ally, but he asked for more help. And we must answer that call. Canadians stand with Ukraine and will answer that call to provide as much help as possible in this time. <laughs> Canadians want to do more. And we heard from President Zelensky that sanctions are important and we want to increase that. We know that one of the most important things we can do we know that Putin does not care. President Putin does not care about the people. He does not care about his country, but he does care about his wealth. And we know the way to attack Putin, the way to make sure that he feels the pressure of the sanctions is to target him where it counts, and that is to target the wealth that is held by his allies and oligarchs. And so we are on that path, and we need to continue to apply the most severe of sanctions possible to target specifically President Putin and his wealth. And we know that we can provide humanitarian help. Canada has done its part and needs to continue to do that. We need to welcome Ukrainians that are fleeing this crisis, that are seeking refuge. We need to provide humanitarian help on the ground. We need to continue to provide that support. President Zelensky has President Zelensky has asked us if we can imagine the horrors of this war, of this war rather. He's asked us if we can imagine if the same war were to happen here in Canada. And this is something that is unfathomable to us. He asked that we increase assistance, and we must do so to Ukraine. We must increase sanctions, and we must meet the needs of Ukrainians, and we will do so. I think about the words that we've heard from President Zelensky, the speeches that he's given, and I think about the moments of courage that we've seen reported from everyday Ukrainians standing up to this violence, standing up to this flagrant aggression of, of President Putin, something that we clearly and firmly denounce. When we see in those moments, we see incredible courage. I, I struggle to find the words to describe it. I think about something my mom always taught me, this phrase in Punjabi. It's chardikala. And I always misunderstood what it meant. She says it means rising spirits. And she always said it's rising spirits in the face of difficult odds. And I can't think a moment to describe the courage of Ukrainians, the courage of President Zelensky. I can't think of a, a more fitting moment to describe that as Tartikala, as rising spirits, as a defiant optimism. In the face of one of the largest armies in the world, Ukrainians are saying we will not back down, we will not give up, and we are so incredibly inspired by them for their fight for democracy, for their fight for freedom, and we stand in full solidarity. We wish their Tartikala, their rising spirits, their defiant optimism to continue, and we will be with you every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Singh. I now invite the House Leader of the Green Party, Ms. Elizabeth May, to say a few words. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, President Zelensky. What an honor for me to take the floor 
in this extraordinary and historical moment. And for all of my dear colleagues, the Green Party is part of a grand green family in many countries of this world. A few days ago, I received the following letter sent by the president of Ukraine's Green Party, Vitaly Kononov, and I quote, Dear Green Friends, we are writing to you from bomb shelters from our home Ukraine, which is mercilessly attacked and bombarded by Russian forces since that fateful day, February 24, 2022. Ukrainians are indiscriminately hit. Collateral damage amounts to total destruction of cities, many civil and social infrastructures that have no relevance to the military are destroyed. Thousands of civilians dead and injured. Millions are fleeing their homes. <sighs> Ukrainian army and civil defense volunteers have taken up arms and are fighting for the survival of Ukraine. They are successful to a great extent, but missile and bomb attacks by air are causing greatest damage. We are helpless. We have no weapons to counter air attacks. We appeal to you for support. Please urge your governments to help protect our sky by having a no-fly zone. For the sake of world peace and security, for democracy and resolution of conflicts, through peaceful means and a rules-based world order, please help Ukraine. Now, it broke my heart to write our dear colleague in Ukraine that all elected Greens around the world have come to the same conclusion, that a no-fly zone will risk a wider war and even a nuclear war. We know these reasons are solid, even though they ring hollow. But we must use every tool, and I fear that the tools we have in front of us are inadequate to the task. President Zelensky, we do not want to let you down. We fear that we may inevitably let you down, but we will find every tool we can find. And where there aren't adequate tools, by God, let's invent them. Mm -hmm. In 1956, in the Suez Crisis, In the crisis in Suez in 1956, not yet Prime Minister, but Lester B. Pearson, a Canadian. We are, we love ourselves here in Canada, we do, but we are an insignificant country in the massive geopolitics of superpowers, but we sometimes get good ideas. Lester B. Pearson invented UN peacekeepers. We need to invent something now that's effective to stop the war, to stop Putin, to save Ukraine. We have to use every single idea, every single sinew, every muscle. We must not relent for one single second. We have seen illegal wars. I've lived long enough to see many w illegal wars based on lies in Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Iraq. Too many innocent lives lost, and now never again. Not one more Ukrainian child. Please, God, stop the bombs. Please, let's have a ceasefire. Please leave a pathway for Vladimir Putin to make it to a negotiating table and find a peace. How do we stop lies? We stop them with the truth. And the truth is the courage of the Ukrainian people. The truth is the courage and the unexpected reality of you, President Zelensky. An honest to God Democrat, a human being, a mensch, a man of such moral courage that the world is inspired. But we must not let you down, because God knows you won't let us down. We must do more. We know this. You are, as our Prime Minister just said, a champion of democracy. May we be worthy to stand by you. May we find the ways that make it meaningful that we stand with you. Not one more lost life, please, God. Not one more mother in Russia who weeps for a lost son in an immoral and illegal war. Thank the brave Russians who face jail just to go on the streets and say, stop the bombing. No more war. close with this, President Zelensky, what I want, what I pray, and I pray for you constantly, and for Ukraine. What I want is that you come here in person, 
that we invite you and we see you here, president of a country at peace, of a free, democratic, and victorious Ukraine. Please come here so that we can hope that in your eyes we remain worthy to be called your friend. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. May. You heard it live right here on CBC News Network, a special bringing you an address from Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky virtually to our House of Commons. It was 12 minutes, 12 minutes of time in which he asked MPs to address explaining bombs falling to their Canadian children, to perhaps imagine someone taking siege of Vancouver, to imagine the Canadian flag being taken out of cities. And really, in, when in the reaction from our members of parliament and leaders of the uh, opposition parties, Jagmeet Singh came through with, it is unimaginable. So if you are just joining us, we carry that live on CBC News Network, that 12 minutes, with minutes of applause afterwards, of the president of Ukraine virtually addressing Canada's House of Commons. I want to bring back CBC's chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, and also the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos, both of them joining us from our nation's capital. Rosemary, so much emotion, and it, it started with emotion, it ended with emotion with uh, the um, Green Party, uh, Elizabeth May. Your thoughts on what you heard? I mean, it was um, a, a, a very, a very good speech, a very strong and even devastating in some ways speech and appeal to Canadians and to the world. I, I thought the um, the method that Mr. Zelensky used, that President Zelensky used by, as you point out, Suhanna, personalizing it for Canadians and for people in that room, asking them to imagine what it would be like. Um, was very moving, was very powerful, and probably gave everyone in that room and everyone watching uh, a moment of pause. But in spite of all that, um, you know, strong, strong rhetoric that, that President Zelensky um, used, and in spite of the sobering moment that it, we were in, you also heard from the president the same plea that he has made time and again, and that is for uh, Canada and NATO allies to close the skies, to close, to st stop the bombing, to uh, to realize that it has gone too far. I would imagine uh, that these are conversations, obviously, that continue. But th there is uh, no one in in NATO allies publicly saying at this stage that that is something they are willing to consider. They believe it is an escalation, that it would lead to full out war between NATO and Russia. And yet, uh, it is the thing that the president keeps asking for. And so I think that makes it difficult uh, for NATO allies and for Canada going forward to continue to say, we're willing to do everything we can, but we're not willing to do this one thing you keep asking for. I also want to ask you, Vashi, uh, your thoughts. But I understand you have some news as well that we can share with our viewers right here. And it regards uh, Melanie Jolie. Our colleague, Travis Danraj, was speaking to the foreign minister just before the Zelensky address to parliament. So what's the latest on that? Yeah, it turns out almost uh, as President Zelensky was addressing parliament, uh, Russia was announcing that it would ban uh, our Prime Minister, as well as Foreign Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, as well as Defence Minister Anita Anand, from entering Russia. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland already has such mm -hmm. a ban placed on her. Uh, but we, a government spokesperson just confirmed that, in fact, the ban, uh, as announced by Russia, does apply to all three individuals, the Prime Minister, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, as well as Defence Minister Anita Anand. I doubt they were planning a trip to Russia anytime right. soon. Obviously, there's a, a real uh, uh, expression from the government lately not to do so, even as an ordinary Canadian citizen. But, uh, but this follows the, the announcement from earlier this morning by Russia 
Russia uh, sanctioning Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, as well as uh, Secretary of State Anthony, Bin Anthony Blinken, rather. Uh, so, so not a huge surprise, but, but follows that announcement very closely. And we'll certainly be watching. I've been checking the uh, alerts. Nothing yet in terms of reaction, because they're, they're all still in the House after that speech from the Ukrainian president. I'd like to get your thoughts as well, Vashi, on this sort of John Lennon-esque, if you will, imagine uh, that Zelensky uh, spoke about in his address. Uh, and one of the things was he said, you know, after this, these 20 days, you really get to know who your friends are. And he did ask Canada, as uh, Rosemary mentioned, for more support in the skies. Yes, he was very pointed about that. I thought, actually, uh, compared to other speeches he's given, he uh, in the past, he was kind of warming up the audience a little bit more first, insofar as he would say, thank you so much for what you've already done for us, but here's what we really need. I thought he kind of went straight to it in, in this address, uh, acknowledging, obviously, the support that Canada has provided so far and the close friendship between the two countries, but then making it very personal, as, as Rosie pointed out, but even more personal than just uh, even towards the Canada, or the examples you highlighted, Vancouver, the CN Tower, addressing the Prime Minister multiple times in this speech by name, even asking him, saying, Justin, can you imagine at 4 a.m. being woken up by these, what, about worrying about your children to the degree that we're worrying about them? All in an effort to underscore, again, as Rosie pointed out, the major ask from Ukraine, which is to close the skies, effectively shoot down Russian planes over Ukraine, because what we have seen is Ukrainian forces have been very successful, sort of successful, I shouldn't say very, sort of successful in staving off the Russian assault on the ground, much more successful than anticipated. Where they have had less success and less ability to succeed is in the sky. And that is where we have seen the devastation particularly take effect, for example, in Mariupol, or even the for the, the, the air base, the military base, rather, in western Ukraine. So there, there is a, a reason that, that, that Ukraine continues to make this ask. At the same time, Joe Biden has said, it's World War III if we do that, which sets the stage and the sort of parameters or threshold very, very high for any country uh, to, to make that decision. Final point to you, Rosemary. Uh, all of the opposition leaders, as you said before, it was going to be a show of unity. Anything surprise you? No, I mean, I, I think there are always points of criticism about the government's policy, but we're not going to hear them here. So, some of the places where you might hear them, though, is around um, immigration and, and refugees, people who want to get out of Ukraine or a third country and get to Canada. Uh, that is still proving at times difficult for people because the government hasn't waived all, uh, all the barriers, including biometrics that are still needed for some people. So I think that there are always going to be some pressure points there for the opposition parties to, to go on. But this was really about about a moment of solidarity, uh, a historic moment for, for Ukraine, obviously, and for the world, but also at this time for, for Canada's parliament to show that it, it stands with Ukraine as best it can at this critical time. And we will see whether, um, you know, there are other NATO meetings ahead, which may lead to more serious conversations about what more Canada and others can do. Thanks for that, Rosemary. That's CBC's Rosemary Barton and also Vashi Capellos, host of Power and Politics. Uh, and you can join Rosemary and Rosemary Barton live on Sunday as well. There'll be much more on this. Uh, thank you both. One of the, if you are just joining us, I mentioned that sort of John Lennon-esque speech because uh, you know that song, Imagine, right? And I think one of the, one of the lines is, imagine, what is it, all the people living life in peace. Well, I suppose... Zelensky asked us to imagine not living in peace, living with bombs falling, living with trying to explain that why to your children. Here is a snippet from that speech in case you missed it. Тим треба більше робити, щоб захистити Україну і захистити Європу від цього тотального зла. That to protect Europe from Russian threat, they're destroying everything, memorial complexes, schools, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, housing complex. They already killed 97 Ukrainian children. We are not asking for much. We are asking for justice, for real support, which will help us to prevail, to defend to save life, to save life all of the world. Canada is leading in these efforts, and I'm hoping that other countries will follow the same suit. We're asking for more of your leadership, and please take more, uh, greater part in these efforts. Justin and all of our friends of, our, of Ukraine, all friends of the truth, 
please understand how important it is for us to close our airspace from Russian missiles and Russian aircrafts. I hope you can understand. I hope you can increase your efforts. You can increase sanctions so they, don't, so they will not have a single dollar to fund their war effort. A historic moment, and it happened in the House of Commons today. For more reaction, our chase team has reached Bob Ray. He is Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, and he is in New York. Bob, always great to talk to you. I want to know your thoughts as you listened to the Ukrainian president say to Canada, imagine this is your life, now do more. Well, I think it was a great speech. Uh, I think all of us should take note. Uh, he took 12 minutes. Uh, to express his thoughts very clearly, cogently. Uh, it was a powerful uh, message to Canadians, uh, asking us to understand the plight of uh, the Ukrainian people and also asking us to do more. Um, I must confess I was not surprised by uh, his cogency. He's an extremely powerful speaker. Uh, and I wasn't surprised by his message. I think his message is one that we all need to hear. Uh, and that is that whatever we're doing so far is helping, uh, but more still needs to be done because the bombs are still dropping and people are still being killed. And uh, I think that's really how we have to measure uh, the effectiveness of all that we're doing. Um, and uh, we've still got more to do. I think that's a, a fair a fair ask, and I think it's a fair a fair a fair question for all of us to to wrestle with. Uh, defense ministers are meeting tomorrow. There'll be other meetings uh, in NATO, meetings here in New York and elsewhere as we look at what else we can do to, to, uh, to change the mm -hmm. situation. But, Am Ambassador, while it may be a fair ask for humanitarian aid, for, you know, taking in uh, more Ukrainians here in Canada as refugees, is it a fair ask to again uh, ask for the skies to be closed when, when there have been, has been so much reaction to that that this is not going to happen, this would be an act of aggression, that's how Russia would look at it, and in fact it would be worse for the world if that happened. Is that a fair ask? I think it's a fair ask. Um, I'm not an armchair general, and I suspect uh, you know, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that we know all the, the factors involved um, in what various military responses are going to be required. Um, I, I think we have to understand that what Russia is doing is not only aggression against Ukraine, uh, it also effectively is aggression against, against the world. Um, food prices are going up dramatically. Uh, the ability of poor countries to survive uh, the tremendous losses in food supply, which is involved in, in, uh, in taking on Ukraine, uh, the t terrible, terrible precedent that this sets for other situations in other countries. Um, we set up the United Nations and we set up NATO in order to deter aggression. And we have to understand that what Russia is doing is aggression. So when people talk to me about uh, we got to worry about Russians escalating, they're already escalating. Mm -hmm. They're escalating every day. And we need to understand the implications of that escalation. Just yesterday, the Secretary General of the United Nations gave a very powerful speech for about three minutes in which he described what is the impact of, of what's happening not only on Ukraine, but also on the entire humanitarian system around the world, on our ability to respond to people in need around the world, and how we have to understand the very critical moment we are in as a result of this Russian aggression. And we have to be able to name it, and we have to be able to do something about it. It's a, it's a global crisis, no question. What are you going to be watching for? There are uh, virtual discussions happening between Russian officials, Ukrainian officials. We know that the EU is is going to be con still considering all kinds of other asks. Canada says there's more to come with sanctions. Tomorrow, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky addresses uh, the U.S. Congress. In, in this picture, on this day 20, what are you watching for in the... I don't even want to say the weeks ahead, because I'm hoping it doesn't go that long, but in the days ahead... I think the critical thing is for us to keep our focus on the actual situation. Uh, a superpower has uh, attacked its neighbor, Ukraine. Uh, in so doing, it is causing a, a massive disruption to the global economy, to global security, to global health, to global well-being. And the question for us is, what more can we do? We've taken unprecedented action. Uh, both in terms of providing military assistance to Ukraine 
and in terms of our humanitarian response, uh, dealing with issues of accountability, going to the International Court in The Hague, uh, and, and all of those responses. But we need to understand <laughs> that the test isn't how much have I done, the test is how effective are the measures we're putting forward in dealing with the full-blown impact of this aggression. And that's the constant test that we have to apply to our own conduct and to the conduct of our, of our allies and our friends and neighbors. And we have to assess, are we being as effective as we mm -hmm. need to be? And that, I think, is the question that needs to be the exclusive focus of, our, of all of our efforts. Um, if you get, everybody gets excited about all the news events, President Zelensky's message to the U.S. Congress will be exactly the same as the message to us. And the message to us was very clear. Appreciate what you're doing. Imagine what it would be like if it was happening to you. And what more are you prepared to do mm -hmm. to give us the security and peace that our people are looking for? As I said, it's not an unreasonable ask. We can all get into the details of the modalities. That's not the issue. Is The issue is how can we be more effective in what we're doing? Final question for you. Uh, my colleague Vashi Capellos, and you've been on her program, uh, Power and Politics, uh, great show. Uh, she spoke with the former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, and a couple of things that he said really stood out for me. He said, our fight is your fight. Our security is your security. Is that the crux of this? Is that the answer to why should I care? Yes, uh, quite simply, uh, that's my simple answer. Yes, it's, it's what I've been trying to say perhaps in more words, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, but it's not just that it's th their fight is our fight here in Canada. It's that what, what has happened, because of the way the world is connected, uh, when you do something like what, what President Putin has done, it isn't just about Ukraine, about Russia. Um, it's about everybody because what he's doing is having a terrible impact on the whole world, and we need to understand that. You be well, sir. Take care. Thank you. Bob care, Ray Samantha. in New York. He is Canada's ambassador to the United Nations. Susan Ormiston is CBC's senior correspondent. She was watching President Zelensky's address to our House of Commons from London today. And she has also spent time, I'm sure you've seen her reporting, during this war inside Ukraine. And she joins me live now, as I mentioned, from London. You heard it. 12 minutes. Applause for about two, probably, before and after. Your thoughts, Susan? Well, as has been said, I think there was a clear message there. We appreciate what you're doing, but you need to do more. And he said, I do not hear a clear answer on what you're going to do. So in amidst that very warm uh, reaction to President Zelensky, there was a firm call, a shout out for Canadians to do more. Uh, I think it's true, as Bob, Red's, Bob Ray said, we've heard this before. I mean, consider... President Zelensky's role today. Every morning he gets up and he does a video for his country saying, I'm still alive, I'm still here, I'm standing up, I'm in Kiev, they haven't forced me out, the city still stands, the capital, and at night he repeats it. He does another video, even showing streets from his presidential office that he's here. He's become an extraordinary character in this horrible, horrible drama. And really, he's doing a dash for diplomacy every day. I mean, these kinds of addresses he's done in multiple world capitals. He's going to speak to Congress tomorrow, and he will have an even firmer ask for President Biden send those fighter jets via Poland to help us here in Ukraine. These kinds of asks have so far been rejected, but he keeps the pressure on. And the way I look at it is really, he's bringing the war right into the hearts of other people, of his allies. He's bringing it right there to all of them and saying, holding them accountable and saying, we appreciate what you're doing, but consider what we're living through. And through his efforts, he's been able to keep this war very much alive, very much at the top of the agenda for the entire world for 20 days. And that is his singular, uh, quite extraordinary achievement as the leader of this country so far. You know, you talk about the efforts to end this war. We heard today, Susan, uh, that there were more sanctions being put on 15, what Canada calls enablers, of uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, war in Ukraine. We're expecting to hear other sanctions as well from Europe. 
I want to know about a plan that three leaders, I believe it's uh, Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovenia, how are their efforts playing into the, the, the whole global push? Well, consider what we're seeing out of Kiev in the last few days. You know, uh, Russians, uh, soldiers encircling the capital city. There have been uh, multiple attacks, bombings on the outskirts of that city. The residents, half of them have fled, but those who are left are sitting in horror and uh, worry every night about what's going to happen. And into that capital city, these three prime ministers of those countries, Poland, Slovenia, and the Czech Republic, are taking a train into the heart of this capital today to show their kind of support for President Zelensky and what he's trying to do. An extraordinary event at this stage in the war where no one can uh, realistically predict what will happen next and whether that city will uh, be further encroached on or bombed. Uh, very difficult. The mayor today of uh, Kiev is has imposed a 36-hour curfew, saying that this is yet another dangerous moment, a crux in the city's history, and asking people to either stay at home or stay in shelter for the next 36 hours. And you have these European parliamentarians, prime ministers rather, coming into the city. Um, really quite unbelievable. We are also hearing that the talks between Russia and Ukraine, a fourth round now, are continuing uh, slowly. But there is sounds of some optimism. It's very hard to read whether that will actually translate into anything. But they say, both Ukraine and Russia, that uh, things like a ceasefire or withdrawing troops are some of the things that are on the table. Uh, President Zelensky, as I said, has kept this focus on this terrible war, but he's going to have to make some tough choices, p potentially, to bring this to an end, and that's to come. He may have to consider territory that he may have to give up in order to save some of his cities, his citizens. That's all to come if, in fact, there is some kind of negotiated settlement. But in the meantime, he is shining a light on this war very effectively. You know, from the moment this invasion began, you know, he did the video saying, I need ammo, I don't need a ride. He became this quite a, uh, an effective communicator and character um, mm -hmm. as the leader of his country. I want to thank you for that, uh, Susan. That is CBC senior correspondent Susan Ormiston. She is in London. And as I mentioned, there is lots of reaction to this. Our chase team has reached Andrei Shevchenko in Lviv. He is a former Ukrainian ambassador to Canada. So Lviv, you've heard about it a lot. A lot of people trying to get to Lviv so they can get over to Poland. It's in the west part of Ukraine. Um, but he joins me now from Lviv. Ambassador Shevchenko, first off, you know, what's your neighborhood? What are things like there in Lviv? Well, Lviv seems to be a safer place than Kharkiv or Kyiv, but definitely the war is in the air as well. And we just launched this uh, media center Ukraine in Lviv specifically to deal with foreign journalists. Uh, from February, starting from February 24, uh, more than 700 of journalists came into Lviv to cover our fight for freedom. And Ambassador, if you're fairly safe there, you're probably keeping an eye on what is happening around the world, the global efforts to try to end this conflict. A fourth round of diplomatic talks, virtual talks between parties from Russia and Ukraine. How optimistic are you? Well, first, there is no place in Ukraine where you can feel safe. And we have air sirens here, just like all over the country here in Lviv. Um, but yes, uh, we uh, we are following everything which is happening in Ukraine and, and uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, I just had a chance to, to watch the president's address to the Canadian parliament. But if your question is about the talks and about the diplomacy, I don't see much space for diplomacy, for, uh, for uh, genuine diplomatic uh, negotiation at the moment. We'll continue to watch to see if uh, there are if those talks do continue. You mentioned your president's speech. It was a historic moment, the first world leader to do so virtually to Canada's uh, House of Commons. His message was, "Imagine this was your life." What did what really stood out for you in your president's address to our House of Commons? Well, this is his signature style, um, uh, very personal, very emotional. And I think he was trying to bring to you what we Ukrainians feel. It's a combination of gratitude 
to Canada and to the Canadians and anger, anger at this weakness of the international order. You see, if you're in Ukraine and um, when you when you think about your relatives who die in their beds, in the in the apartment blocks in Kharkiv or Kyiv, when you think about all the, those broken lives, if you think about all those civilians, words like international order and the United Nations, they seem to be a joke which doesn't doesn't uh, make any sense here on the ground. So I think President Zelensky wanted to bring that feeling uh, to Ottawa, to Canada, and I think he was quite successful with that. And asking again for safe skies, do you envision any movement on that front? Because it has been no after no after no. I think we should we should more we should be more specific about what exactly we are asking for. We need no fly zones or no fly corridors for humanitarian reasons. It's not the way to win this war. It's not the way to stop this war. But this is a very precise way to stop or to 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 decrease civi civilian casualties. And this is the way how we can protect uh, many civilian infrastructure. And this is the way how we can bring more life and humanitarian uh, humanitarian uh, stuff into the cities which are which are right now under under the siege. So we we do need this no fly zone for humanitarian purposes and I think we'll have to do that sooner or later. I want to thank you for that, Ambassador. Always a pleasure to have you on the program. Andriy Shevchenko joining us from Leave. He is a former Ukrainian ambassador to Canada. We always keep you uh, informed of live events. This is happening right now. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie speaking with reporters. We'll listen in together. The uh, position of the Canadian government has always been the same, the same as that of its allies. The objective is not to declare an international conflict or a third world war. We are going to act accordingly. I think that we need to be proactive uh, in helping Ukraine in the counter-attack against the Russian offensive, and that is why we are continuing to offer weapons to Ukraine and to make sure that they are sent to Ukraine, and we are going to continue with these sanctions. Does that mean that there are any options that are off the table? As I said, our goal is always uh, to not create an international conflict, and so our position will be in line with uh, that of NATO countries. The position remains the same. Uh, throughout the alliance in making sure that there would be a red line, and this red line would be not to trigger an international conflict. That has been our position. Now, we want to make sure that we can support Ukraine to defend its airspace. We will do so, obviously, by providing military support. Uh, sorry, when I say military, lethal aid, as well as making sure that we, uh, again, continue to have strong sanctions. Um, it is important for Canada to be able also to provide that lethal aid directly to Ukraine. Uh, my colleague, Minister Anand, has been doing a great uh, amount of work on this. Uh, many of the deliveries have been successfully uh, uh, delivered. And at you didn't answer my question, which was, is there no way to institute a no-fly zone, even a partial one, without triggering a war? We are always willing to look at many scenarios right now, because we know Ukrainian people need help. And Canada will always lead conversations to find creative solutions. But at this point, based on the information we have, we have a red line that we can't cross. Minister, I understand that Russia has sanctioned you and Minister Anand and the Prime Minister from going to Russia. What's your response to that? I'm not surprised, and I won't back down. Will it have any impact? I mean, surely you don't have any dealings, business dealings or other, with Russia or Russian entities in Canada. So what do you see it as? Well, you know, uh, what, sorry, I just want to understand your question, Donna. Do you have any dealings, economic or otherwise business or otherwise, that might be affected by sanctions, or is this more a diplomatic persona non grata thing? No, and my mother would be very surprised if I did. Uh, 
faut vraiment que le Canada en fasse plus et de parler de cette zone d'exclusion aérienne. Est-ce que jusqu'à maintenant, vous avez l'impression que le Canada en fait assez? Écoutez, j'ai eu plusieurs conversations avec mon homologue euh, ukrainien. J'ai eu plusieurs conversations avec mes amis ukrainiens, y compris ce week-end et hier. We have spoken um, approximately every day or every second day. And what he told me yesterday was, Melanie, the most important thing is that Canada send us weapons and uh, ensure that extremely severe sanctions are placed on Russia, because this helps Ukraine to defend itself, but it also helps Ukraine at the negotiations table. So that is why we are going to continue offering that support. At the same time, I am also with my my, uh, in contact with my G7 uh, colleagues because we need to ensure that we can coordinate and have an enormous impact together. That's how we've been doing things since the beginning. Um, Bien, il va de soi que mon collègue, le ministre de l'Immigration, aura l'occasion de... de... My colleague, the immigration minister, will have the opportunity to give more information on the new program that is going to be put in place starting on March 17th. I have uh, had several conversations with the prime minister about how we can help the various neighboring countries around Ukraine. Certainly our goal is to be able to uh, bring these uh, refugees and so we are having conversations about that. Mm -hmm. Is, we've heard about this plan to have uh, Canadian planes bring people out of Poland. Is that a possibility? Yes, there are all options are on the table. The visa program is going to be put in place on March 17th. Je comprends, mais pour, pour faire en sorte que les réfugiés viennent... How are we going to get so many people out of Poland, though? Well, in order to be able to get people here, we need to first have the program. We'll open up the program, they will be able to apply, and for those who are interested in coming to Canada, we will be able to move forward. The other issue is family uh, reunification. There are, of course, 1.4 million uh, Ukrainian Canadians here uh, in Canada, and so we will be working with the people who would like to reunite with their families. The Prime Minister and several members of the Cabinet have uh, taken part in the efforts to uh, bring Ukrainians to Canada. We are going to continue working towards this. Why does it seem like Canada is just going progressively slow? Well, um, that's not his opinion, uh, and this is clearly not our is opinion either. More than I think what we need to do is continue every day, every week, to announce sanctions like we did just today. When we do so, we do so in coordination with the G7 um, ministers of foreign affairs. Uh, this is through our different uh, diplomatic channels, and we're coordinating. Uh, that being said, we know we have to do more. And we know that our sanctions must uh, go really around Putin and, and in, in targeting Putin himself, which we have done. Uh, but we, as I mentioned on uh, the question of the no-fly zone, we're in creative mode. We want to make sure that we have as strong sanctions as possible because we know they work and we know we have to continue that economic pressure. You've asked a question, so I'll take somebody and I'll get to you. What more can you do without crossing that red line? The president is asking Canada to do more. What else is in your arsenal before you cross that red line? Like I mentioned, we need to make sure, first and foremost, on the lethal weapon side, we need to continue our deliveries. My colleague, Minister Anand, is doing a fantastic job on that. On the question of sanctions, we need to do more. We will be doing more. My team and I are on it, and we're working with our G7 um, ministers as well, and working with Christopher Freeland, Minister of Finance, on it. What we need to do also, we need to continue, diplomatically speaking, to isolate Russia and put maximum pressure. We're doing that 
in different forests across the board, but we're looking also at other scenarios to isolate Russia. Can you respond to the Conservatives who said today in the House that Canada should support um, a no-fly zone over humanitarian corridors? Has your red line meant that you will not support a no-fly zone over humanitarian corridors should they be negotiated? Well, first and foremost, Russia needs to accept that there are humanitarian corridors. And when they have uh, humanitarian corridors in place, they can bomb civilians at the same time or help their army. So Meanwhile, the to Canada, though? so our goal is to make sure that we follow up the negotiations and to push to make sure that there are indeed humanitarian corridors and these humanitarian corridors are, um, are um, uh, how can I say, uh, safe for civilians and that uh, Russia stops lying about how they are protecting civilians when it comes to humanitarian corridors, is which no? is a fundamental issue. Is that a no to Canadian pros over those corridors? Our goal is to make sure that, like I mentioned, that we protect uh, civilians when uh, there are humanitarian corridors, but at the same time, we need to make sure other, with all the members of the alliance that we don't cross the red line of tar targeting, uh, of making sure that there is a, an international conflict. Well, and so... On a déjà dit que la demande, dans le fond, le, le nom... We have already said that the number of applications for U Ukrainian refugees will be unlimited. Ben, j'ai été informé ce matin, je suis pas surprise, puis ça fait... I was informed this morning, I was not surprised. It doesn't mean that I will be retreating. There's nothing to be said in this speech that has changed your mind about Canada potentially enforcing any kind of a So the key thing that the, Prime Minister, the President said today was that Canada was leading the international efforts and supporting Ukraine. I was there when the Prime Minister called Zelensky. We were both in Munich in Germany last week. And when the Prime Minister asked Zelensky whether he wanted to address uh, Canadians through the House of Commons, uh, President Zelensky said overwhelmingly yes, because Canada has been one of our greatest allies. This was shown today in his speech. And so therefore, um, we will do as much as possible. We know that Canadians from all walks of life, from coast to coast to coast, are engaged and want us to do even more, and will do so. But at the same time, Canadians expect us to be uh, acting in a way that we're not triggering an international conflict. But President Zelensky also yeah. said Some that he yeah. wants Canada to go further. He also mentioned quite clearly that if you imagine asking your friends for help and then you get basically thoughts and prayers, does that speak directly to what Canada has been doing in response? No, of course not. You've been reporting that we've been sending weapons uh, pretty much every right, week and, no and at zone. the same time sanctions. So we all know that that's not the case. But he wants a no-fly zone. And I said, and I've, you know, you've asked me the question, and my answer has been since the beginning, we need to make sure that we're not triggering an international conflict. And at the same time, we're in crea creative mode, and we're willing to uh, talk with allies to see how we can further support Ukraine. What does that mean, being in creative mode? As you know, Canada is not a, a significant military power in the world. So the idea is to bring everybody to the table, to work with the Europeans, with the Americans, so that we can come up with a solution that will bring the conflict to an end. But in order to do this, we need to ensure that Ukrainians are capable of defending themselves, because the negotiations table will help them to have uh, to reach a diplomatic solution. That's why we are doing our part and encouraging other countries to do their part by putting very severe economic sanctions in place. I'm not surprised. No one is surprised. We all expected this. We have already put sanctions in place against uh, President Putin, against uh, various ministers, uh, finance, uh, uh, against all the 
uh, members of uh, his government, and so yeah. we are not going to retreat based on what has just happened. Thank you. Melanie Jolie in Ottawa. We just heard from her. She spoke with reporters. Um, and asked again about that no-fly zone, the the request that has we've heard again and again from Ukraine that they create this safe zone. Uh, Minister Jolie says, you know, that we, in her words, we are in creative mode on that no-fly zone. Also some breaking news. Uh, oh, you know what? Before I get to that, I, I will tell you the breaking news. I mean, I can't just leave it there. Um, Melanie uh, Jolie, uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and our Defence Minister Anita Anand, both all three banned from going to Russia. So let me take you now to... Um, Yves-François Blanchet, the leader of the Bloc Québécois, speaking with reporters after that Zelensky speech and the address to the House of Commons. And so he has been able to draw attention uh, the world over to himself. And uh, without that, perhaps Ukraine would currently be in an even more difficult position than what we are seeing right now. So he has been able to really uh, draw solidarity. We often say, you know, Canada needs to work in concerted action with other countries of the world. We need to make sure that this is done. However, there are a couple of issues that uh, are coming from uh, domestic politics, also uh, foreign affairs, but we've got some particular issues here in Canada. So first of all, the importance of the military contribution. We are it, we know that Canada is not a major military power, but Canada can do a lot in humanitarian terms. So I'm inviting the government to uh, offer financing. If $30 million is, uh, you know, a dollar per Canadian, we need to be sending medical resources and things in order to support uh, refugees in Ukraine. So we need to really take advantage of this space that we've been given to uh, reach the public and talk about building a humanitarian bridge. We need to bring a stop to these parameters, to all of these things that have been laid out. When people are uh, facing being bombed, when we see people who just grab a suitcase and run, when we see uh, people pushing children in strollers in order to flee Ukraine. You can't ask people to fill out forms, uh, to apply for a visa. This is a life-saving operation. We cannot have this kind of these, this bureaucratic uh, red tape. These people need to get out. We need to save the lives of Ukrainian refugees. People are, anyone that you phone in the, a riding office, they're going to, uh, you know, say that they cannot uh, keep up, they cannot send all of the uh, items that people are collecting to donate. So we need to make sure that we go and get these people, we bring them to Canada and we make this process easier. You said during your speech that I think that the international community needs to continue to provide weapons to Ukraine. If Canada can provide something valuable, then that's great. But of course, Canada is not a global military power. 
And so we're not going to be able to provide the weapons that will make the difference in this war. We need to work together with countries who are capable of providing this greater military support. I, I support this. Um, nothing stops us from helping, but we are not a major power. So you're asking to remove all visa requirements? I think that it's a bit bizarre to say that there might be uh, Russians uh, who uh, support the war, uh, who are trying to get in. Uh, these security tests can be done when people arrive, as this has been done in the past. So testing people from a country where there is a, a lack of safety in that area, we need to be able to test them here to speed up the process. For the no-fly zone and the humanitarian corridor, I agree with the Canadian government that this is a risk that we cannot take. I am not going to ask for something that seems to be irresponsible. Anyone who is ready to murder thousands of people is someone who has severe uh, mental problems, and this person with these severe mental problems has his finger on the nuclear button, and so we need to keep that in mind. The Putin regi regime uh, so not, you know, when I say Russia, I refer to the Putin regime. We are looking at this risk of escalation, and so we need to be cautious. Perhaps uh, something could be put in place for us to start looking at, you know, having more serious uh, negotiations. The Kremlin regime has uh, made extremely uh, violent uh, moves in order to spread terror. We need to bring the pa uh, balance of power into our favor in order to reestablish negotiations. I don't know. However, I know that when we are in the opposition, we, you know, are able to make uh, proposals that we like because we won't have to deal with the consequences afterwards. What do you think about the requests? Canada is currently making its contributions. When we work in collaboration with the UN, with the G7, the G20, NATO, in order to put economic sanctions in place and to offer humanitarian support, I agree with this, I support this. I think that the position being taken right now is correct. I am just asking for humanitarian aid to be increased and that the humanitarian bridge be put in place without any further delays. We need to send planes there, we need to fill them up, we need to bring them back, and we need to remove all of the security requirements on the Ukrainian end. We can deal with that when they arrive in Canada. Am I on the list? You're number 29. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, I would simply say that this is part of a show in which I didn't ask to be part, but uh, I don't take this very seriously. And I must admit that I did not plan to go in Russia anytime soon. No. What do you think Canada ought to be doing for refugees? Act much, much, much faster. You do not ask people to go through some tests and verifications and biometric tests when their life is actually threatened. You 
rent planes, you send the planes over there, you fill the planes, you bring them back, and then you have all the time in the world to make all the tests and all the inquiries you want to do about those people. Now, the idea is to save lives, and I believe there's nothing else to be done uh, than do it fast. There's a difference between immigration and saving lives. It's a matter of saving lives. Why do you think the government hasn't done that already? I would like to know. If I did know, I would make some suggestions. For the time being, I do not understand. Alexi has been working on that for days and days and asking for it. I understand that the, the machine, immigration Canadian machine, is not entirely up to the task now. So that's one more reason to put some criteria aside and just go help people bring them here. Some of them will want to stay. Some of them will want to go back afterwards. And we have to respect that. But now there is an emergency. Let's behave accordingly. Does it seem to you Question like anything was learned uh, from the uh, committee? committee. Oui. Oui. That's an excellent question. The uh, International Organization of the Francophonie, its role is um, not that strong. I don't think that the countries in the Francophonie are less affected by the Ukrainian conflict than anyone else. There uh, are a significant number of uh, Ukrainians in uh, Francophone countries. I would uh, ask all countries and organizations to uh, take the clearest position possible. We need to uh, improve our balance of power and we need to ensure that this balance of power isn't shifted simply by savage brutality. First of all, I would thank, uh, I would like to inform you that I had no intention of traveling to Russia, so I'm not concerned about being put on the blacklist. There's a difference between the sanctions which I am imposed, which mean absolutely nothing, and the sanctions which are imposed to some oligarchs, which lose tens of millions of dollars a day because of those sanctions. They must feel it hurts a little bit more. Merci beaucoup. Hello, I'm Arti Pohl. This is CBC News Network. We were just listening in to Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette speaking on an historic day in Ottawa. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky delivered an address to Parliament. He called Canada a reliable partner to Ukraine, but called on the country to do more. He said he's grateful to Canada for the weapons it has supplied and for the sanctions it has imposed on Russia. He stressed that the airspace needs to be closed. The bombing, he said, needs to stop, and he asked that Canada impose additional sanctions. Zelensky asked the Prime Minister and everyone in the House of Commons to try to imagine cruise missiles hitting Canada. Take a listen. <laughs> І вже другий тиждень під обстрілами без електрики повністю, без зв'язку, без всього, майже без їжі, точно без води у подвалах. Джастіне, шановні присутні, панове, уявіть, що значить кожного дня чути доповідь про загиблих дітей. Так, ви президент. Або керівник уряду, але ви просто про це чуєте, про загиблих дітей. І загиблих стає все більше і більше. 97 убитих дітей на сьогоднішній ранок. Знаменита Сіен Тауер у Торонто. 
And that was just a small excerpt of uh, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky's address to Parliament earlier today, and we will have more of that throughout the program. So for more on that speech and Parliament's response to it, I do want to bring in the CBC's Evan Dyer. So, Evan, you were listening into that. There was actually also some news uh, that we just learned from the Bloc Québécois leader about uh, several Canadian officials now that have been banned from entering Russia. That kind of right. had simultaneously with the address that was happening with Zelensky. So maybe you can tell us about the message we heard from Ukraine's president and about that news that we learned about Canadian officials. Well, let's start with those sanctions on Canadian officials, essentially tit-for-tat sanctions being introduced by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, less meaningful, really, than the, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russian officials, mm -hmm. which really bar them from travel to a very wide part of the world. Canadian officials will only be prevented from going to Russia. And we just heard Yves-Francois Blanchet say that that was not in his plans anyway. So... Uh, we have seen now the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister added to a list that already included some uh, Canadian politicians. Canadian Russia has actually been doing this with Canadian politicians for quite some time, and it's done it in response to uh, official acts in Canada, including uh, the passage of the Magnitsky Act, for example. So uh, it's, it's an escalation, but it's more symbolic, perhaps, than real. Uh, when we come to the, to the speech itself today, you know, as expected, President Zelensky sort of mixed the tone of gratitude with a, a tone also of you could be doing a lot more and you need to do a lot more. You could call it a tone of reproach, really. Um, he, perhaps less expectedly, uh, he also tried to personalize the conflict for Canadians in quite an effective way, you know, saying to Canadians, basically, look at those pictures you've been seeing on your screens of, of blocks of apartments being bombed, of hospitals being bombed, and now transpose those images onto your, your own country, Canada. Imagine if cruise missiles were falling on Ottawa Airport. He mentioned other cities, Montreal, Vancouver. If you woke up at four in the morning and Russian tanks had crossed your border, how would you explain it to your children? Pretty, pretty effective. And of course, coming into this, the Canadian government knew that President Zelensky was not just coming to say thank you for the past assistance, but was going to come also with a list of demands. Uh, and even that tone, that tone of you haven't been doing as much as you could. And so before he spoke, we saw Prime Minister Trudeau speak uh, and he was at effort, at pains, you might say, to stress all the aid that Canada has already given to Ukraine and is still willing to give more, he said, uh, and all of the sanctions, which, of course, is one area where Canada has led the way among its NATO allies. Let's watch a little bit of what Prime Minister Trudeau said before President Zelensky's book. With allies and partners, we're imposing crippling sanctions to make sure Putin and his enablers in Russia and Belarus are held accountable. Today, in line with our European Union partners, I can announce that we have imposed severe sanctions on 15 new Russian officials, including government and military elites who are complicit in this illegal war. So now, what could Canada do? Yeah, Justin Trudeau did promise to do more, uh, but as we just saw from Melanie Jolie, there's no movement on that demand for a no-fly zone. Canada still opposed to widening this conflict in that way. Uh, what, are, what about providing more arms, therefore, which is another thing that Ukraine has been asking for very insistently, in fact, running out, running rapidly through the arms that various Western countries have given it. There doesn't appear to be any political opposition to that, Arthur. You could say that uh, the main limitation on Canada at this point is logistical. It's what does Canada actually have to give? Uh, but we've seen even traditionally the most pacifist of parties, Bloc Québécois, uh, not only oppose put up no opposition to the idea of arming Ukraine more, but ask for more arms to be given and faster. Let's watch that. Let's watch Yves-Francois Blanchet, head of a party that has opposed most military entanglements, talking about arms for Ukraine. It is with dismay that we have also heard your call for more weapons. You are entitled to them. You need them. Your people have the right to defend those they love. They have the right to defend this land that is theirs. So yes, Mr. President, let's arm the Ukrainians rapidly and more significantly. So that's some of the response to that to this speech that, as I say, it mixed tones of gratitude and a recognition of the special relationship Canada has had with Ukraine, uh, with a bit of a tone of reproach. And he didn't he didn't waste time in getting to that, getting very quickly through the thank you for what you've done, and very quickly to the what have you done for me lately, and what more can you do for me in the future. So, Evan, you, you mentioned that there was a tone of reproach along with the thanks to Canada. How was the issue yep. of the no-fly zone handled by Zelensky and then by parliamentarians? Well, we saw 
President Zelensky get to it pretty quickly, and he didn't mince words. We wouldn't expect him to because he rarely misses an opportunity to call for that. It's not surprising as the president of a people under bombardment that he feels obliged to call for that, uh, just, you know, in terms of his own domestic audience, who, of course, are crying out for some kind of air cover. Uh, we saw Canadian political parties react somewhat differently to it. And let's look at a little sample from two parties, the official opposition, the Conservatives, Candace Bergen, and the Green Party's Elizabeth May. We must stand with Ukraine. It is not a choice. It is a moral duty. We need to protect, at a minimum, the airspace over the humanitarian corridors so that Ukrainians can seek safe passage away from the war zones and to allow humanitarian relief to reach those areas under siege. It broke my heart to write our dear colleague in Ukraine that all elected Greens around the world have come to the same conclusion that a no-fly zone will risk a wider war and even a nuclear war. We know these reasons are solid, even though they ring hollow. But we must use every tool. And I fear that the tools we have in front of us are inadequate to the task. President Zelensky, we do not want to let you down. So there you have the Conservatives essentially calling for a limited no-fly zone, a no-fly zone that would cover humanitarian corridors within Ukraine, something that no major NATO country has advocated. We heard from Elizabeth May the other side of that, a side that's consistent with what we've heard from people like President Biden, which is that while the heart may tell you to do it, the head argues against doing it, uh, because as President Biden has said, a no-fly zone is tantamount to the beginning of World War III. You cannot enforce it without shooting down Russian aircraft. And once NATO aircraft or missiles begin downing Russian aircraft, you're into a war with Russia. And, you know, we have perhaps seen a bit of a shifting tone from President Zelensky over the last few days, going from just calling for a no-fly zone to saying something along the lines of, if you can't give us the no-fly zone, at least give us combat aircraft. And so because he's aware of those realities that NATO operates by consensus and this doesn't appear likely to happen in the near future, he may be bargaining somewhat, making that maximalist demand that he knows probably won't be granted uh, in order to later bargain that down to what is also a very big ask, which is for NATO to supply MiG aircraft so that if there is no no-fly zone, the Ukrainians can at least try on their own to bring down Russian aircraft, drones, cruise missiles, etc. Thanks for the latest on this, Evan. That is the CBC's Evan Dyer in Chelsea, Quebec. So for more on this, I do also want to welcome to our program Alexander Rodnyansky. He is an economics professor and advisor to President Zelensky. Alexander is in Kiev. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So you have helped draft speeches like this before, like what we just heard from Zelensky in his address to Parliament. What is the significance of this kind of an address? Well, it's very significant. It obviously sends the message, explains what's happening in Ukraine and is asking for more support. I mean, our people are dying every day, and we need the world to know what's going on and to understand what's at stake more generally. There are, as we know, 338 members of parliament, 105 senators, 1.4 million Ukrainian Canadians. So who was President Zelensky really trying to connect with here? Well, he was trying to connect with the whole Canadian people, not really making any distinctions about left or right or any sort of group. It's about communicating the message, showing the state that we're in, and saying that time is running out. I mean, we're facing arguably one of the strongest, if not the strongest army in the world, and we're holding up, but we need more support, and urgently so. You watched the address, I presume, and, and perhaps the response as well? Well, I heard some responses just now, of course. And what did you make of the response that Zelensky received from Canadian lawmakers? Well, you can see that everybody, um, left and right, any political party is basically supporting uh, Ukraine to the fullest, and we're grateful for that. But more needs to happen soon. I mean, we need, as you rightly said, uh, we need a no-fly zone. But if that's hard to establish, we need the military capabilities to be able to do it ourselves. That means very advanced air defense systems such that we can shoot down missiles and, of course, um, you know, fighter jets, preferably. Now, the response to the no-fly zone continues to be, uh, you know, a rejection from NATO allies. It, also, the response today from Canadian lawmakers as they listen to Zelensky. 
How much is that a point of frustration, or is it something that is very much understood uh, by the leadership, despite the fact that we do hear this request from Zelensky very frequently? Yeah, so this is certainly a point of frustration, as you say, because for us, this is not just a you know, cool decision that needs to be made, uh, weighing up all the different arguments. I mean, our people are dying every day. Cities are destroyed every day. Kiev got bombed heavily today. Uh, which is probably a precursor to some to a storm on Kiev. So uh, we really have no time. There is frustration, of course, and that is, I hope that's natural for everyone to understand. And make no mistake, sooner or later, this regime will, the West will have to engage with this regime one way or another. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner the West understands that, the better for everyone, the less costly it will be. So that is what you foresee happening, that the West will have to intervene? Well, at the very least, I, I think that a regime like that, which has revealed its true nature by now, it's an authoritarian, brutal regime, is not going to disappear uh, by itself. It's not going to say, oh, look, um, our, um, you know, our war in Ukraine didn't, didn't go too well, so we're going to pull back and live happily in peace ever after with our neighbors. That's not going to happen. That's an illusion. So uh, the West needs to put maximum pressure on the Russian regime now. That means economic san sanctions, further economic sanctions, such that they cannot sell oil and gas and therefore finance the war. And that means, of course, arming Ukraine and making sure that we can protect our skies. You know, you speak of sanctions, and just prior to his address, the Canadian government, the Canadian Prime Minister, announced more sanctions against 15 Russian officials. So do you think that those sanctions from Canada, from a number of different countries who have imposed sanctions against Russia and oligarchs, do you think they are having an effect? Well, when it comes to personal targeted sanctions, those actually should have been imposed earlier, especially given what we know now, because their effects play, play out over time. They are very effective if, if a large group of the Russian elites is actually targeted over time, and they're very effective in the medium run, medium run in terms of putting pressure on the Russian regime. They are useful now, but unfortunately they are um, insufficient at this stage. We need much more vehement sanctions, general economic sanctions on the Russian economy such that we can prevent them from financing this war further. You know, while Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky was addressing uh, Canadian lawmakers, there was an announcement that, in fact, there were sanctions that would be placed on Canada's Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Defence Minister. We learned also the leader of the Bloc Québécois that they would not be allowed to enter Russia. What do you make of that response from Russia uh, to, supposedly, of course, the response that Canada has given to the invasion of Ukraine? Well, this is very typical. This is how the Russians proceed all along these years. They've been doing this whenever a sanction or some sort of international political move was made by the West, they would always reciprocate. You know, whether positive or negative, but mainly negative, of course, over the years, because there was always bad relations and deteriorating relations with Russia. So that's not surprising. That's exactly as they've done before. It should be expected. Um, it is, of course, a little ironic. I mean, it's, you know, traveling to Russia is not as important. Having wealth in Russia is obviously not as important to Canadian elites as to the Russian elites in terms of having wealth and traveling to the West. You know, I do want to just play a clip for you, for you right now. This is just breaking that the White House press secretary, Jan Psaki, has announced that uh, the U.S. president, Joe Biden, will be traveling to the NATO summit to take place next Thursday in Brussels. I just want to play this for you and then get your reaction to that news. News some of you have been asking about. The president will travel to Brussels, Belgium later this month, where he will join an extraordinary NATO summit on March 24th to discuss ongoing deterrence and defense efforts in response to Russia's unprovoked and unjustified attack on Ukraine, as well as to refer, reaffirm our ironclad commitment to our NATO allies. Uh, he will also join a scheduled European Council summit to discuss our shared concerns about Ukraine, including... So, Alexander, you heard that news there from the White House press secretary. In our discussion, you've said that you believe the West is going to inevitably get involved. What do you make of that news? Yeah, well, I mean, that's part of the realization. I welcome the fact that NATO is reacting. But from our perspective, of course, that's still insufficient. I mean, we welcome the fact that there is more NATO troops at the border close to Russia now. That gives extra protection to the NATO members in the east of Europe. But of course, that doesn't give 
directly more protection to us. Our people are still dying, our cities are destroyed. So we'd like to have what I just mentioned, we'd like to have a no-fly zone. If not a no-fly zone, we need to have the military facilities to be able to do it ourselves. And just finally, I wanted to ask you, because you are in Kyiv, what, what is the situation there outside of your window? Well, I'm actually traveling now, so I'm in Berlin t having some talks, but I came from Kyiv just now, so you're, you're correct about that. I mean, the situation is uh, perilous, of course. I mean, the city is empty, has been empty for so quite some time, and I think it's getting worse. So we've actually been leaving Kiev on occasion because entering Kiev is quite dangerous these days. And um, it's just, yeah, it's horrendous. Well, Alexander, we very much appreciate your time and uh, you sharing your experience with us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Alexander Rodnyansky is in Berlin traveling right now. He's an economics professor and an advisor to the president of Ukraine. Now, immediately following his address to Parliament, President Zelensky turned his attention back to events at home. Russian forces are continuing their assault on several fronts across Ukraine, even as the two sides engage in more diplomacy.